हेलो 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 चेक चेक Good morning ladies and gentlemen welcome to the symposium on ensuring sustainability of rural drinking water system i am prerna sen gupta and i will be your host today uh, today's symposium has been organized by iim bangalore in collaboration with uh, arkhyam and e governments this symposium aims to engage key stakeholders in cross learning understanding challenges and seeking solutions we are honored to have with us today distinguished speakers from academia industry government and public charitable foundation who will share their insights experiences on various aspects of sustainability of thinking water system There will be four parts to the symposium. The first of which will consist of two keynote speeches. Case studies from diverse contexts will be presented in the second part. The third part will involve group discussions, and the fourth part will consist of panel discussions and the synthesis of the group work. We hope that this symposium will stimulate your interest and curiosity in sustainable drinking water system and foster collaboration and dialogue among different stakeholders. We also hope that this symposium will inspire you to think critically and creatively about how to harness the potential of sustainable drinking water infrastructure. Before we begin our program I would like to invite Professor Gopal Naik, the JJM Chair Professor, to deliver his opening remarks. Please welcome Professor Gopal Naik with a big round of applause. It's okay, I think. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this symposium on sustainability of drinking water system being organized by the JJ himself at IIM Bangalore, Agyam, E-Governance Foundation, and Mr. Pawan Sachdev, who is an alumnus of this institute, deeply interested in uh, drinking water system and a number of studies, including one in Cambodia, and published books on drinking water system. Uh, considering the scale of the JGM in reaching 19.4 crore rural households and the potential impact it can make by ensuring safe and adequate drinking water available to all uh, rural households, such as reducing drudgery for uh, fetching water, particularly for women, significant improvement in health and education of children. potential for employment generation in fact we estimated the total potential uh, employment could be in the range of about 2.8 crores uh, for the construction and about 1.3 sorry about 13 lakhs uh, uh, perpetual employment uh, in operations and management building social harmony and enhancing social status of rural people government is committed to spend huge budget on this mission the learning from the previous efforts on the household tap connection has made the mission for to focus on functionality uh, of the household tap connection and therefore the emphasis has not only been on required infrastructure creation but also on the service delivery model by the community and local bodies jjm prepared and supplied comprehensive guidelines on the project implementation and operations uh, organizing uh, sorry emphasizing community involvement during construction uh, and uh, manage operations and maintenance once it is functional 
As per the recent data, the mission has covered more than 70% of the habitations in terms of uh, connecting uh, households. Very laudable considering the size of the mission, the scale of infrastructure development needed, the diversity of the country in terms of water source, gaps in functioning, and managerial cap capability of the local bodies, and self-help culture of local community. The uh, need for understanding uh, the field implementation issues, particularly in terms of long-term sustainability of this uh, exercise is enormous. Drinking water service delivery by community being key to successful implementation of the mission, the current situation of passive willingness of the local community needs deeper understanding at this stage uh, of implementation in order to strategize the ongoing efforts so that the extent of certification of villages can be quickly enhanced. We think making the system functional and sustainable needs intensive involvement of all stakeholders, government at all levels, academics, researchers, NGOs, funding organizations, and community-based organizations and others to work collaboratively to ensure successful completion of the mission. It is in this context we thought of organizing this symposium to understand the issues arising in implementation and actions needed to ensure sustainability. We have identified source, operational, financial, and institutional sustainability as the key areas to focus on. We have in this room and through our online connect, people representing governments at all levels, uh, organizations who have been working in the area of drinking water for many years as actual or supporting implementation of JGM or uh, drinking water schemes in general, bringing several years of experience to the proceedings of this symposium. We hope to deepen our understanding and find effective recourse to the current implementation challenges. So in this session, our director, Professor Rishikesh Krishnan, will deliver the inaugural address. And then we have keynote addresses from the uh, national uh, JJM mission, as well as the state JJM mission, giving us the national and state's perspective on the current situation in implementing the mission. We then present case studies from various states, uh, Bihar, West Bengal, Punjab, Orissa, and Karnataka, to understand the factors contributing to the sustainability of the drinking water system and key challenges that needs to be addressed. We then, in groups consisting of people with varied experience and experience, discuss each of these sustainability components in detail to understand challenges and possible solutions. We will then have a plenary meeting to collate these challenges and solutions and think about how to take them forward. I welcome you all once again, particularly Mr. Pradeep Singh, who is the director of the National uh, Jaljeevan Mission at New Delhi, and Mr. Mr. Hussain, who, is, who will be joining us very shortly. Uh, he's the chief engineer of the uh, Rural Water Scheme in Karnataka, uh, Government of Karnataka, for accepting our invitation and delivering our keynote addresses and, and, and participation. Uh, we look for, forward to an engaging and fruitful discussion during the day. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Professor Naik, for the comprehensive overview of JJM. Now I would like to invite the director of IIM Bangalore, Professor Rishikesha T. Krishnan, Please welcome Professor Rishikesha with a big round of applause. Yeah, good morning and welcome to IMB. Uh, IMB has a fairly long history of working in the area of public policy and public management. In fact, when this institute was started, that was one of our mandates. And in fact, for many years, we had a sectoral structure in our faculty where faculty were focused on specific sectors largely related to infrastructure and economic development. 
since the last 20 plus years, we've also had a Center for Public Policy, which again focuses on issues of policy and governance. And we have been running a very successful postgraduate program in public policy and management also for over 20 years now. So we have a very strong interest and commitment to working on issues of uh, public policy, public management, and governance. And the current symposium today falls very well within this context of what we have been doing over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, we are particularly happy and honored that the government chose to set up one of the Jaljeevan Mission chairs here at IIM Bangalore. While most of the other chairs have been set up in technology institutes and focusing more on the technical aspects of water supply, delivery, and so on, our focus is more on the operations and managerial aspects, and I'm glad to see that today's symposium is largely focused on uh, those issues. Uh, personally, I don't have a much background in water, except to say that several years ago, I did a project for the Karnataka Urban Water Supply and Drainage Board, I think almost 20 years back, and I remember as part of that, we went all over Karnataka looking at their infrastructure and facilities. But one of the interesting things I do recall from that time was there was not much focus on rural water supply. I think the assumption was that the rural areas will sort of take care of their own water requirements, maybe through local arrangements. But a lot of the focus seemed to be on the urban water supply. And I'm glad to see that the government has set up such an ambitious project like Jaljeevan Mission to ensure that everyone across the country gets uh, good quality uh, water. So this is a very ambitious project, and I think Professor Gopal Naik shared some of the statistics, and it's amazing to see the kind of progress that has been made, and I hope today's deliberations will assist in carrying this forward and ending the whole project successfully as envisaged by the government. I'm particularly happy that we have uh, Sri Pradeep Singh here from the Jaljeevan Mission. Thank you for being with us and Mr. Pawan Sachdeva. Pawan is, a, as Professor Gopal Naik mentioned, he's a very enthusiastic alumnus of ours. He doesn't have any particular reason why he should be supporting this, except that he has a deep interest in the water sector, and he has been associated with some of our other initiatives in this domain. He also came and taught a course to our students last year, though not on water, <laughs> more related to his core domain, which is finance. So Pawan, thanks for your close involvement with the Institute and all the support you have been uh, giving us. Uh, the last thing I would just mention is that here at the Institute, we are very strongly focused on sustainability. Last year, we set up a sustainability task force where we are saying, you know, we can't preach sustainability to others unless we first practice it ourselves. So that's the main objective of our sustainability task force. Currently, we generate about 15% of our power requirement through rooftop solar. This year, we'll be increasing that to 20%. We are fairly good at water recycling. We have extensive rainwater harvesting network on campus. This has resulted in a significant rise in the water level, at least locally. Uh, we have got a good functional STP, and we ensure that all the water from that goes back into horticulture. So we are trying to utilize all the STP treated water as well. And we think we are reasonably well on the path to becoming fairly strongly sustainable in water. That's one area where we see we have good scope because we have many of the systems in place. And with a little further investment and care, we can make that happen. We also have a very good system for waste recycling on campus. Uh, we have our own segregation center. I don't know if you'll have time today, but if you have time, you can walk across. It's behind the hostels. So we make sure that all waste that leaves campus is pre-segregated before it goes out. And that's been functioning now for several years. So that's another thing in place. So we are also looking now at other ways in which we can save more energy. We can reduce paper consumption. A lot of initiatives in the Institute. So I hope uh, these will bear fruit in the years to come and we'll make our own small contribution. The idea is also to set a good example for our students because they will all go into important positions in the industry. So we are hoping that with this exposure to the sustainability initiatives on campus, they will take this with them when they go to their uh, careers. Uh, we also are trying our best to strengthen the ESG part of our curriculum. So the most recent MBA curriculum review, which we did two years ago, we identified this as a major area of focus. And we are now looking at all the different ways in which we can not only offer additional courses, but make sure that ESG is 
embedded in the core subjects which the students learn. I mean, that's probably more important. It should not be seen as something that's separate or additional, but it should be seen as an integral part of whatever they are doing in their MBA coursework. So once again, let me welcome all of you. Let me wish you a very useful symposium today and good deliberations. And let me once again thank you all for being part of this symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Krishnan, for addressing the audience and for sharing some very interesting facts. We would like to welcome Shri Azaz Hussain, who is uh, the chief engineer of RW, uh, RDWS. Please come and sit and join here. A big round of applause for Azaz Hussain. Thank you so much. Now, without further ado, let us move to our first keynote speaker by Sri Pradeep Singh, who is the director of Department of Drinking Water and Sanitation, JJM. Big round of applause for Sri Pradeep Singh. Thank you, sir. So, very good morning to all. <clears throat> I am indeed humbled by the presence of such. Uh, dignitaries of great stature working on a uh, subject of drinking water. Uh, Director, I, I am Bangalore, uh, alumni Shri Pawanji, Professor Gopal Nayak, Engineer in Chief, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so I will not uh, tell you about the statistics. I think we have a very functional dashboard that you uh, must be accessing it on almost daily basis, those who work in drinking water sector, and Professor Gopal Nayak has already told the, about the progress that we have done. Uh, but I will start with uh, 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 just uh, underlying certain uh, opportunities that has been provided by Jal Jeevan Mission in terms of innovation, in terms of bringing all the stakeholders together to solve this question of providing such a basic service to our citizens to make their lives easier. Uh, right from the, in terms of uh, institutional design, if we see, we have a national Jal Jeevan Mission uh, um, <coughs> headed by a uh, mission director and uh, supported by uh, 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 all the aspects that need to be there uh, while implementing a program of such large scale, providing such ba uh, basic service. Uh, uh, so uh, we have not only the monitoring of infrastructure associated thing, we also have, uh, 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 we also deal with asp aspects such as capacity building, water quality monitoring, uh, how to make things functional at grassroots level, how to leverage partnerships, how to uh, engage with institution of uh, eminence, uh, which can provide critical insights and can bridge the gap between uh, implemented, implement, uh, implement, implementing, implementing uh, agencies and academia. So uh, this is a really exciting time in terms of uh, water supply sector. And with such large political commit, uh, with such strong political commitment and investment that we are seeing uh, that has been done, is being done uh, over a five years period, I think we can, uh, if we can uh, put our energies together, we can do wonders. I'll just highlight uh, 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 in terms of infrastructure, uh, you know what we have done. But in terms of assuring that these uh, uh, services remi remain accessible, uh, they become easily accessible to uh, each and every rural household, rural citizens. Uh, they are uh, easily, uh, so uh, we, we say it in a very, uh, um, our secretary says in a very uh, good way, uh, access, ease of access, and then continued access. So uh, uh, availability of taps and making sure that taps remains functional and it fun remains functional over a long period of time. So Professor uh, Gopal Nak told us about uh, sustainability part, uh, the sustainability of resource, first of all, uh, then sustainability of our institutions. The institutions remain functionable, functional. They answer the uh, grievances. They, uh, they have certain benchmarks against which they should be, their performance should, should be measured. And they have uh, access to finance. They have uh, uh, financial sustainability as well. So we are working on those aspects. 
and uh, now uh, many states, almost six states, have uh, completed their work in rural areas. So uh, each of the states is now developing their ONM policy, and therefore this uh, symposium is at a very right uh, time, so that critical inputs, critical insights can go into it. Uh, the uh, ONM policy that states are coming up with is, is very comprehensive. It talks about uh, 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 how the engage, how the what will be the key roles of each stakeholder, the pani, how the pani under Jal Jeevan Mission. There is a lot of emphasis on community participation. We have invested in ISAs, in support agencies, in KRCs, so that the, those capacities at local level is developed. So how those uh, capacities will be utilized? What will be their engagement with? Uh, uh, departments, uh, what will be the uh, ONM models in places where contractors are also given uh, 10 years uh, uh, operation and maintenance uh, uh, contracts. So, uh, so all these things, so there are, uh, uh, each state has a unique uh, 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 setup, a unique background in which they are working and uh, therefore the ONM model, uh, the principles can be same, will be tweaked for each state. And then I think uh, uh, when we have a, a day-long seminar or symposium on these issues, I think it, it will really help. <coughs> uh, under Jal Jeevan Mission, we are thinking that uh, all six lakh villages will be working as a local water utility. Above that, there will be these departments, rural water supply departments, public health engineering departments, which will be te providing technical supports, or, uh, and in some cases, they themselves will also be providing the uh, uh, taking over the responsibility of VWC as well. Uh, and, and so in that scenario, how we will monitor or gauge the uh, performance of these water utilities against each other? How we will, uh, uh, what will be the uh, water user charges? Uh, how it will uh, merge with the uh, existing socio-political situation? In some states, there is a clear-cut uh, 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 guidance that there will not be any user charge collection at state level. In those scenarios, how those efficiencies will be derived, how the public service, how the water service delivery will be ensured. And then we have another uh, situation where each household is metered. And what are the advantages? Or is it necessary? So all these questions, uh, I think, uh, are very relevant. And uh, when we have 19.4 uh, crore uh, customers to, do, to uh, 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 provide service for, in those scenarios, <coughs> I think, uh, uh, creating a common uh, platform, creating a, a platform, uh, creating key, uh, key parameters on which the performance of these uh, uh, service providers uh, can be measured, can be monitored, and can be incentivized, I think will be a very uh, important uh, 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 intervention, which at national level at least we should uh, set up and uh, help states to uh, use these uh, per performance indicators and uh, continue to uh, improve the service delivery to uh, our citizens. So I think with that, I will stop. And I am more here. Here I am here to learn more. And I hope that uh, this discussion will help us a lot. Thank you so much for giving this my opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Singh, for your enlightening speech and for suggesting some very interesting policies. Uh, it is now time for our second keynote speaker, Sri Azaz Hussain, who is the Chief Engineer of RDWS Karnataka, to present his views on rural development perspective on ONM of drinking water schemes through Gram Panchayat Institution. A big round of applause for Mr. Hussain. Good morning all, uh, Director IMB, Chair Professor Gopal Naik sir, alumni of this uh, institute, Sri Pradeep Singh Director, and uh, all the uh, participants here. Yeah. You can put it in the slideshow mode. Uh, just uh, to uh, bring it, I will have a brief presentation on this. Uh, no, <laughs> is it not visible? Okay. Yes. Uh, 
So 10 minutes of time is given for me to discuss on the, uh, <laughs> not, not an issue. It is a, from the rural development perspective on the water schemes through Gram Panchayat institutions. Uh, myself being in the government organization uh, should be able to explain you in detail. I will take a brief uh, uh, introduction of the different schemes that uh, I will be having. Uh, when we come to the drinking water uh, source, the all basic four needs as is sustainability, the quantity, the quality, and the regularity. These are the four pillars on which the entire drinking water system stands. And when we come to the schemes which uh, uh, give water to the village, we have uh, two different types of uh, water supplies. There's bulk water supply and the uh, retail supply. And when we come to the bulk water supply, either it can be through a surface source, uh, most of them, usually reservoirs or the tanks, and the single village schemes uh, for the retail supply, in a village through bore wells. And when we come to the multi-risk component, this I'm giving just because I want to say as to how we need to maintain all these things. Uh, when we come to the multi village schemes, uh, we have um, components of the different structures wherein we will be having a head work drawing water from the source. Uh, basically, most in most of the cases, rivers or reservoirs. And there will be invariably a treatment plant which has to uh, treat the water. And then there will be a supply network through master balancing reservoirs, through zonal balancing reservoirs, and the village tanks. And when we come to the single village schemes, wherein only a single village through a bore well is given water, we will be having a, a pumping arrangement to draw water from the bore well, and then we will be having uh, treatment units depending on the uh, contamination or the quality of water there. And then there will be a network giving the water in the uh, village. And uh, this in-village distribution system uh, will, be, uh, will be providing through either augmentation of the existing thing or will be retrofitting with the existing thing. And uh, the different components which uh, we find in a village, basically, when we want to look into the O number of the village things, there will be an overhead tank and there will be a pipe network. And uh, this Karnataka state's speciality, just I want to mention that whatever connections we are giving are invariably provided with a meter. All connections are metered now in Karnataka. That is one speciality which other states may not be following. So one advantage of this, uh, just be before I go into the maintenance of the schemes, is that the people are getting awareness to use the water. When uh, we go to villages, initially there was a lot of resistance for providing meters. Saying that why you want to install meter, you want to charge us, was the question by the villages. And subsequently, after a lot of persuasion, and lot of uh, uh, ISA activities, we could convince them that this is not just to uh, make them pay the charges, but to have the awareness and to measure, to see that the minimum quantity of water is supplied to each household. That was the main concern. And now that the people are uh, ready and they are agreeing to adopt the meter, and in some of the villages when we went, we saw that uh, uh, people are saying that you lock, put a lock to the tap so that our water is not wasted. Otherwise, the meter will run and we'll be consuming more water and there will be wastage of water. And uh, in a broad sense, when we see the water supply arrangements, uh, the state government has to take the full responsibility. And different departments are involved in any of the water supply scheme. When we have the state government's got uh, intervention for providing budget and approvals, there has to be a department taking care of the water supply scheme. In uh, most of the states, we have PHE departments. Here we call it as Rural Drinking Water and Sanitation Department in Karnataka, and uh, it is under RDPR. And we have the involvement of finance department to make the necessary budgetary provision for the schemes, and the water resources department to make us uh, give the permission to draw the water. And uh, this is the basic thing that which uh, I need to stress upon. When we come to see the local governments, the Gram Panchayats as a whole, uh, the, as far as, uh, as early, earlier Pradeep Singh was mentioning, uh, the ONM policy is an important factor for any uh, maintenance of schemes in the state. And uh, most of the states have come up with the policies, and uh, Karnataka is also 
on the verge of finalizing the OM policy. In our OM policy, we have uh, prescribed that the bulk water shall be the respons responsibility of the state government. And the in-village distribution network shall be taken care by the Gram Panchayats. That is the basic standard the state government has taken. And in most of the states, this is the thing that is followed. And when we come to the Gram Panchayats, what is their role in the maintenance of water supply schemes is the point of discussion now. So when we come to it, there we need to have a village and water sanitation committees. That is the first thing that they should form so that uh, there is a better management of water supply network in the villages. And they are supposed to prepare village action plans because uh, the villagers will be fully aware of what is their need, what is the existing system, and what is the requirement for that village. So based on that, they are supposed to prepare the village action plans. And uh, then when we come to the water tariff collection, that is the uh, thing that, uh, which uh, is the, uh, what we can say, a kind of uh, uh, discussion with, between the politicians and the officers to be open with you. Because in fact, when we want to levy any tariff on the villagers, there will be a resistance from the political side. That uh, is one thing that we are facing here. The uh, second thing is that uh, the Gram Panchayats have to pay the water charges to the department when they get the bulk water. That is one thing that is also important for a Gram Panchayat to take note of it. And when we come to the uh, quality of water, they are also supposed to have a look into the water quality. And the last thing is that entire operation system they have to take care. Same thing I have listed in the next slide here, what uh, the Panchayat Raj institutions are supposed to do. Uh, as uh, already I have told you, that the bulk water supply is to be maintained by the state department, and then the ONM has to be taken care of by the village and water sanitation committees. Their planning and implementation is also to be taken care of by the VWSCs, and uh, as uh, I have already told, the uh, quality, wa quality of water is also to be ensured by the VWSCs. There are prescribed procedures for testing the water quality that has to be ensured by the VWSCs. And uh, there has to be dedicated pump operators. There has to be a system for collection of charges. And uh, these committees should meet regularly once in a month. Usually, in most of the villages that what we have visited, we have found that the first Thursday or any Tuesday of the first uh, Tuesday of the month of the meet month, they will be having a meeting. What are the key issues and the challenges which we are facing? Uh, the first thing is that uh, though we are insisting on the formation of VWSCs, still the villagers uh, don't have that sense of ownership. That is one thing that which is lacking. lacking. And the second thing is that uh, uh, even though they try to maintain it, but uh, still the skill uh, re required to maintain the schemes is not available at the uh, village level. That is what uh, is the major challenge. We need to train not only the VWC members, or, and, uh, but also the villagers, so that they themselves should be able to attend to any ONM issues that which they come across. And uh, the third issue is with respect to energy charges. In most of the cases, we have found that the Gram Panchas or the VWCs are not able to sustain the energy charges. That is uh, one thing which uh, is the point of concern. Then ONM policy, uh, some of the states also need to have the ONM policy. And then there is a requirement of having a water budget for the Gram Panchayat. They should analyze as to what is uh, uh, both in terms of quantity and uh, also in terms of its financial sustainability. They should analyze as to what charges they should collect so that they are self-sufficient to maintain the scheme. And uh, as is known, when we don't charge anything, uh, there will be definitely uh, issues of water. People will not care as to how much water they use and how much the water they waste. And the, the last thing is that there must be a system wherein the grievances are redressed. There has to be an efficient grievance redressal management system. So last thing, what is the way forward? We need to sensitize and train all the VWCs so that they are capable of maintaining the uh, schemes in village. And uh, there has to be and capacity building for ONM at the village level. That is the necessity and the need of the hour. And then they should be able to maintain or prepare a budget 
for O&M so that uh, the gram purchase themselves should be able to uh, maintain or uh, run the scheme. And then there has to be O&M policy, uh, whichever state is not uh, still having that O&M policy, uh, they have to get it in place immediately. And the last thing is that they have to operationalize, operationalize the energy costs because that is the one thing which will be a very high burden on the gram panchayats. The one option is that they can explore this solar thing that is also now moving ahead. So with this, uh, I come to an end. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hussain, for your informative presentation. Uh, our next segment is about the case studies from diverse context. I would like to invite Mr. Manu Srivastava, who is the COO of Arkham, to give an overview about the five case studies. A big round of applause for Manu Srivastava. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Mr. Pradeep Singh and Mr. Ayaz Hussain uh, for highlighting the opportunities within the JGM and giving a perspective on the operation maintenance issues of rural drinking water supplies. Mr. Ayaz Hussain, you mentioned the key issues very, very succinctly. Thanks a ton for that. As we progress towards 100% coverage uh, of the rural households across the country that is transforming the lives of the rural India, it is imperative that the progress achieved by the mission is sustained for the years to come. The focus right now is on the FSTC, but there are more than about nine states which have achieved 100% coverage and 10 states with about 75% coverage already, and others are catching up rapid, rapidly. The focus needs to shift very quickly to the o &M if the investments made on infrastructure are to sustain. The landscape for o is going to be very complex, just as the installation of the schemes itself was very complex. Uh, there is going to be multi-village schemes, single village schemes, schemes with different capacities and designs, schemes in water quality affected areas where it will require much more than just a disinfection. Tariff models will vary depending on various parameters as well. There will be very different schemes for o &M maintenance itself as well. It could be contractor based, it could be SSG based, it could be led by the community institutions themselves. Systems of grievance redressal need to be measured Customer satisfaction needs to be measured, and all these systems have to be set up. These are just a few aspects, and there will be a lot more. It is with this intent that conference is bringing about some of the case studies from diverse areas across the country, giving insights to us as policymakers, researchers, and practitioners, and take back from what has worked and what could be improved upon. In these case studies, we'll use a 4 D framework. Uh, Mr. Pradeep Singh briefly mentioned it as well. Uh, that was introduced by the authors uh, in, this, in the book titled The Norm Penn Story for understanding, analyzing, and learning the operations of the rural water supply. The drinking, the sustainability of the drinking water supplies can be characterized into four different, four key dimensions. Uh, the source sustainability, the operational sustainability, the financial sustainability, and the institutional arrangements that allow different stakeholders to work towards uh, achieving the overall sustainability of the uh, schemes. The framework is very simple and intuitive to understand. <coughs> and all the four case studies will use the same framework. Uh, the source sustainability is about availability of the required quantity and the permissible quality of water as of today and for future periods of time. Operational sustainability looks at the percentage of uh, penetration of water services into the targeted households, the quality of water supply, the design and construction aspects that will have a bearing on the long-term maintenance of the infrastructure, trained and motivated land manpower, leadership at all levels so that all of them can solve the problems at their own level, roles and responsibilities of different organizations for the upkeep of the assets, and consumer grievances and redressals. The framework emphasizes the fact that the water supply is more of a service business and not just a production business. The financial sustainability is a very critical aspect which looks at the evolving operating expenditure, asset maintenance, and replacement provisioning, and how the operating and capital expenditure is funded by tariffs, grants, and transfers. The institutional arrangement looks at the roles and responsibilities of different institutions in fulfilling the sustained water supply and if the requisite policies are in place and how the, the policies are performing as compared to the uh, documented policies. We have five different case studies today. 
Uh, as uh, Mr. Pradeep Singh and Mr. Ayaz has mentioned, community ownership is a key part of the Jal Jeevan mission design. However, the participatory behaviors from the individuals and from different community members towards Jal Jeevan mission may be subject to very systematic, social, and psychological barriers. Mr. Divyang Vavagela from Tata Trust will talk about the insights of their work on the social behavioral change to drive community ownership. Pankaj Kumar uh, from Aga Khan Rural Support Program India will present his insights from their work on the community institutions-led ONM model in the three blocks of Muzaffarpur district in Bihar. He will talk about how water supply schemes have become more reliable and communities have started paying for the water charges as a result of community engagement, strengthening the frontline workers and handholding of the uh, uh, frontline workers itself as well. Sujata Tripathi uh, from Water for People will present a case study on managing drinking water infrastructure in West Bengal. They share their experiences in working in the Digambarpur GP and the system strengthening work which required a very kind of different end of design and model of engagement and technology played a key role in scaling their work up. T. Krishna Kumar uh, from eGovernments Foundation will present a case study on how the platform-based approach is enabling financial sustainability of schemes managed by PhD in Punjab. The IMB team will present their research on community-managed single uh, village drinking water supply schemes in the tribal areas of the Ganjam district in Odisha. 100% community engagement and the VWSC ownership in those schemes is a model we need to look at. They'll also present uh, their initial research on the MVS schemes in Gokarna, Karnataka. The case study and the following discussion would help to create and give feedback to improve the state of name policies. We have 15 minutes each for each of these case studies and five minutes following that for Q&A. Uh, the IMB presentation will have about 30 minutes uh, because there will be two case studies over there followed by 10 minutes of questions. Uh, I think that's about it and I think now I invite Divyang Vagela from Tata Trust to share their work on the social and behavior. Uh, we have break now? Okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah, coffee. <laughs> That's important. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Shivasava. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the symposium, the first part of the symposium. It is now time for a short break. But before that, we will be heading downstairs for a group photograph. So uh, after that, please uh, join us for a short coffee break near the registration desk. We will be resuming the session at 10.40. Thank you so much for your attention.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the symposium on ensuring sustainability of rural drinking water systems. I hope you had a good time connecting with each other over coffee. Let us now begin with the first case study on social behavioral change communication for community ownership, for which I would like to invite Mr. Divyang Waghela, the head of Tata Water Mission. A big round of applause for Mr. Divya. Okay, um, good morning everyone and would like to thank uh, I am Bangalore and Department of Drinking Water and Sanitation for providing this opportunity to me. Uh, and I'll share something about the, some work what we have done on the social behavioral change communication as a part of the safe drinking water. And uh, thank you. So the, <coughs> the, uh, so the behavioral change to drive the community ownership. And I think as you all are aware, the participation of community and ownership are um, two core principles of the Jal Jeevan Mission program. And uh, in the morning when uh, we were talking about, and uh, Manu was mentioning about the institutional sustainability, financial sustainability, and source and system sustainability, uh, I also think that the uh, sustainability of a behavioral is very, very important and interlinked with all other sustainability aspect. And hence, it's very important how we can actually look at the sustainability in the totality. Um, we all are aware about the uh, objective of JJM, which is also focusing on the sustainability of all elements, what I mentioned. Uh, but how we are actually driving the uh, participatory behavior, which actually hence uh, see that there is a kind of adoption of the system, infrastructure, and services by the community. Uh, someone already mentioned that there are going to be six select like water user utility services, but whether those utility services are going to own and adopt this whole infrastructure and then use as a service provider, uh, work as a service provider or not. And hence the uh, behavioral sustainability is important, which is impacted through various systematic social and psychological barriers and triggers. And I'll talk a few of them in the next few slides. Uh, so this uh, study, so we have done the uh, ethnography research in uh, different states, looking at the socio-cultural diversity. We also looked at in terms of the water scarce region, water abundant region, water quality affected areas, and try to come out with what are the one uniform insight which can help us in terms of a triggering the behavior uh, of the community and at the different levels. And, and hence it's a, uh, important in terms of the community to take uh, ownership and pride of the system. It's not Sarkari system, it's not Sarkar ka system. Ye hamara system hai, ye hamara paani hai, hamari paani ki yojana hai. That kind of a belief system we wanted to build up. Uh, so the government has invested huge amount of resources into it on the JJM, 50 billion dollar. Uh, but informing about the people about various element of the program or elements of system, whether that will help in terms of uh, triggering the behavior or addressing the barriers which are there within the communities. So obviously the answer is no. And then hence, we need to look at that different level of behavior need to be triggered, different level of barriers need to be addressed. And what are those uh, different levels? So we looked at three broader level of the behavioral uh, barriers and triggers. One is about the societal level. We say that the Gram Panchayat, Village Water and Sanitation Committee is going to be the core process holder for the system. And hence, we need to look at how the collective ownership of the system should be part of the process. It cannot be an individual ownership, but it could be a collective ownership. 
So if we see the panchayat as a utility service, where the panchayat him, themselves are looking themselves as a providing the services to the users, and hence the full ownership of the system through collective action need to be drived, need to be driven by the behavioral change communication. Uh, important aspect in that, uh, once this community ownership happens, it should become a social norm. Otherwise, with the change in the political system within the village, the chances of falling back to the old system or falling back to the, or disowning the system will be high. And hence, if we want to make it a social norm of collective action, it will help in terms of ensuring the longer term sustainability. The second uh, uh, aspect is at the household level, and which is, we feel that it's linked with the various aspects, but one of the critical aspects is about the paying for a water bill. So paying water tariff regularly for the services they are getting. And that's, I think, the one of the biggest trigger in terms of the, the household level we found. Uh, so what we realize is that uh, the willingness to pay is going to be high if there is a regular desired quantity, quality, and regularity will be continuously provided as a services. And hence, the first level behavior at the community level will help in terms of ensuring that the household behavior also is going to be changed. The second behavior we also found that the once water comes in household, whether it's being judiciously used or not, and that will link to the source sustainability. The consumption pattern change once the water comes at the household level. And whether we are or in a position to trigger that behavior at the household level in terms of using it efficiently, optimize the demand so that we can get the sustainable water supply from the system. The third uh, behavior we uh, looked at in terms of an individual level, and when we say individual, there are different perceptions of uh, water at the household within the family. So the women value of water may be very high if they are managing and fetching water from the long distance, or even the managing the basic household course with water is responsibility of women, adults, and girls. So that's why the value of water may be high among the women group, but whether the male members also share the similar uh, insights or similar value of water for the having a tap water within the household. And that is also then linking in terms of the weather. Someone is willing to pay, someone is, but whether there is an affordability element is also included into that or not. And that's why the decisions in terms of uh, male members becomes very important when the, someone has to pay 50, 100, 200 rupees a month on the water bill. So these are the two, uh, three different layers we actually look at in terms of the behavior. Uh, what are the key findings and insights we got it? And uh, these insights, because we had done it around a year, year and a half, this study, we have launched this uh, communication campaign also. But the important find, we, when we did the different geographical uh, uh, assessment, we found that the value of water are in two perspectives. One is the quantity. So the water scarce area like Rajasthan or maybe like uh, Maharashtra uh, or in Karnataka or Andhra, the quantity uh, element or the value of water with reference to quantity is always very high because they know that the, they have a limited availability of water. But in those cases, the quality of water, value of quality of water was substantially low among the users because they could not connect the health impacts or outcomes with the quality of water. So they know that they, I'm getting water from the hand pump borewell or tap connectivity, but whether it's safe or not. So unless and until whether there is a direct understanding at the community, household, individual level about the impact of poor water quality on health, the value of water will go up. Uh, in last three years, I think the Government of India has done substantial work on the water quality aspects in terms of testing, which has triggered that the yes, quality is equally important, but whether you are connecting the quality parameters with the health outcomes or not, that is a still, I think, the bridge someone has to, I mean, that needs to be crossed. Second, I think in the first presentation, uh, Chief Engineer Sir also mentioned about the low level of uh, engagement ability or low level of engagement of the community. So always the community ask a question, what is it in for me? Whether this is going to be something benefiting me at the society level, household level, what is, that question is always coming up. And if you actually answer that questions with both rational as well as emotional argument, it will hold true, but if you only give the rational answer, it might have a higher chances that the people will not 
I mean, the people will not accept it, or will, after some time, it will not have a long-term behavior. The third element, which we found, it's about to take for granted. So many households who have started getting water at households, they take it for granted. So they don't value water, they don't respect water, and hence the behavioral patterns changes, and which will always going to have an impact. And I think on the O&M sustainability, these are, this is some of the element which needs to be addressed, be it gray water management, effective or efficient use of water, um, on stuff. Uh, the last two are more in terms of the communication, how the communication has happened, whether the communication has happened about the scheme information, whether the communication happened about the benefits of the schemes or the component of scheme. And again, the question comes in terms of the whether it's a visible, uh, contextual visibility is there or not. What benefits I'm going to get? And I'm going to just share because most of the us are professionals in the sector, the practitioners in the sector, we know that what are the uh, benefits of the safe water. And the last part is about the lack of citizen champion. It is always external people are coming and changing the behavior or triggering someone's behavior, but whether there is an individual champion who can help in terms of a, taking the message forward. Because when it comes from the external, it comes as a more as a rational thinking in terms of argumenting, in terms of justifying the process, not in terms of saying that Ki, this is your own uh, system. This all are true for gender, class, and caste. So we have actually looked at all the elements when we did the study. Uh, and as I mentioned that the, the value of water, if it's dialed up higher level in terms of the quality parameters and other, there are higher chances that the all other barriers could be effectively addressed. So I think we tried and focused that the value of water within the community or individual households, different target audience need to be dialed up very, very significantly. Once we do that, all other elements could then fall into place. And then we looked at in terms of what could be the desired behavior we should achieve. So the targeted current behavior, this is obviously the people understand this is a scheme which is being government, government has been putting up an infrastructure to provide the water to everyone. It will help us uh, in it, if they have to provide some initial investment, it would be a one-time investment or one-time capital investment. What we are trying to see that in terms of the desired behavior to ensure ownership of the system. So we looked at three broader part, adoption, which links with the ownership, appreciation, appreciation means trying to pay for services. So then it means appreciate, they appreciate the water coming home, safe water coming regularly, so I should pay. So that's an appreciation. And the third part which actually triggers more in sustained behavior is called celebration. Once the community at collective level starts celebrating having a water at the doorstep, that might help in terms of the sustaining the behavior and it might trigger help in terms of providing the water bill and also looking at the operational care post the infrastructure is created. Uh, these are some of the key benefits we know that, uh, that what benefits in terms of safety, so the waterborne disease will be reduced, uh, if also will help keep the body healthy. Uh, we also need to look at in terms of what are the positive behaviors, uh, positive elements which are linked with the water. We always say ki pani kharaab hoga, to tabiyat kharaab hogi. But pani aapko hydrate bhi karta hai, aapki skin bhi achhi karta hai, aapke baal bhi achhi karta hai. And there are some uh, insights we received from the Crom community that the girl child goes to a safe source to wash their uh, hair because they know that otherwise isse mere baal jharte hai. So it's also linked with the kind of an aspired value of water within the individuals. And that we could, I think, build in terms of the water plus benefits. Convenience is saving time, enhancing the opportunity cost for the community, reduce the medical list. All those things are very much known benefits. But how we can actually put it into a one single messaging and then convey it to the community. And that's why what the uh, different hypotheses which we have tested on ground, uh, we found that the every individual societal level, so one thing which actually everyone wants to have with them, irrespective of caste, class, uh, you know, the uh, other gender barriers, and uh, this also linked with the progressiveness, which is called respect. So people, if start connecting themselves, having a tap water at household with respect, it might help in terms of ensuring that they will respect the water, they will respect the tap water, and whatever they want to do it, so whatever the behavior we want to trigger, either paying for water bill, treatment of water quality at the household level, or judicious use, all these things 
can be driven through a single messaging call respect and if we want to make it in a little of a little bit on a creative perspective because this is the insights from research we try and see that ki how this research uh, should be create to put up into the creative thing in terms of broadly i would say a marketing perspective and that why we call it tata uh, the tap water at household is equal to a samman so aap sirf pani ka nal ghar pe nahi la rahe hai aap apne ghar pe samman la rahe hai humne bahut sari cheeze suni thi aise ki panidar hona hai kiski pagdi unchi rahegi to lot of things linked with the respect at the societal at the household or at the individual level so if we try and build that connection of water at household is equal to samman the value of water will go up and the people will try and uh, take a responsibility and ownership of the system at all the three levels what i mentioned earlier so we come out with a small uh, this is a poster there are other elements also but this is trying to look at ki agar pani se ghar mein pa nal se pani aayega to samman laayega so it's not only coming water at home coming water safe water through tap at home is the i think the proposition which we have actually uh, focused and then uh, we created some films because positive of time will not be able to show the film i have some qr codes which can be shared and which can be used by you uh, but i think the important part in terms of we have now launched this campaign and this is more in terms of a one caveat i would like to say this stand alone campaign will never work in behavioral change it's need to be integrated with the your community mobilization process so we understand that as a part of a system strengthening this is an important tool which can be used by the isas krcs or even the village water and sanitation committee so we have started this implementation in uh, around six different states the good part is that the state governments have liked this idea in terms of a creating a hook of samman or respect with the every households at at the village level they are also creating something on reward and recognition samman logo ka karo jo log acche se karte acche se water committee manage karte hai ya water tariff collect karte hai so there are some of the photographs where some people are celebrating having a tap water at household and some are adopting passing some resolutions at the community level some of the key learnings uh, i think uh, there are films and infotainments there are a lot of elements we have created as a part of the campaign the learnings are from the field that uh, the engaging element is very important when people start engaging through music through some kind of emotional connect there is a larger recall value the memorability will be high so this also helps them in terms of looking at this is not sarkar ka scheme this is hamara scheme that connect they can start building up when we started the uh, implementation uh, we always try to look at the positive tone of communication is very very important so rather than putting up a more kind of a negative connotation always try to push the positive connotation at the every level so that the people connect well and positively use these things a uh, strong emotional connect which appeal to heart which i think it's very very important but then it also helps in terms of bringing the rational thinking so rather than going with the rational thinking how you look at the emotional connect and then push the rational thinking which can then help in terms of the quality and its impact on health uh, as i already mentioned it's a part of a community mobilization process it cannot be an isolation be executed or implemented currently we are looking at impact measurement it's very difficult to measure the impact of behavioral change communication and there are two level of uh, 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 elements which we are trying to measure one is intent to change the behavior so if i try and trigger the behavior of water treatment household there may be change in the intent but whether this is intent is really changing into the practice that is going to be the process so we are looking at in terms of a 90 days so there are some behavioral um, uh, experts from the center for social and behavioral uh, change from ashoka university behavioral insight unit some experts who are helping in terms of creating a impact metric measurement metric so that you can understand where is there, there is a change in the intent or there is a change in the practices uh, so that's that's all from my end these are some of the different elements which we try to focus here the qr code so we created a one core film which can give all messages keeping the samman as a uh, core element then we look at how the importance of role in management of the system be it a part of the 
uh, village water and sanitation committee be the part of a SSG group which is playing a role in the ONM. So we try and focus that the role of women is important. So we created one specific elements on it. Why to pay water bill? And I think we, this element need to be taken up on a upfront. We can't, uh, you know, put the water bill as a different connotation. So we say ki, when we take mobile bill, electricity bill, water is also B. If you are looking at it as a service program, not at the infrastructure program. So if you focus on a water bill, again, building both emotional and rational thinking, the importance of water quality, how it's impacting your health outcomes, and collective ownership and collective action at the community level. So these are the five different elements which we have done. Uh, we have got a good results. We have now trained almost uh, 37 implementation support agencies in Jharkhand. We are going to train around 140 ISAs in UP, Assam. Uh, we are looking at some ISAs in Tripura. So I think the, if state adopts it and use the multiple uh, layers to engage uh, with this common messaging, it might help in terms of the triggering the behavior. And I just, uh, with the last point, which I think we, uh, we have actual experience as a practitioners in the Swachh Bharat mission, we use the Izzadgar as a, one of the uh, strong uh, communication messages, which work quite well at the individual or household level. I think similar level, this is also look at more as a progressiveness. So that might help in terms of looking at. Uh, we'll be happy to share the results down the line two months once we get the results or the intent and practice. Thank you very much. Any questions? If uh, you have the opportunity to ask question, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and the microphone will be passed to you. Yes, I think you have one. Okay. Do these messages change considerably from in different villages? Mm. Because these are from underlying. I understand these are underlying stuff, but do you change? depending on the context of water ease of water availability locally, et cetera, do you change the messages? Uh, no, so uh, when we did the research, we found that what is a uniform insight which cut across across, be it in UP or Jharkhand or Assam or Gujarat. So there is a single thing which need to be, need to be focused on. So the message should be a common, uniform, and then around that particular message, you can create all your other elements of it. So we don't change the message. Uh, but the, as I mentioned, there are different elements which we included into the messaging part. So if you want to focus on the quality, there are message on the quality which ultimately takes on the Samman as a core element or a core messaging part. So that way we don't generally change the message. We have created some, based on the insights, we created that these are the barriers which we need to address so that the messaging have been created based on those barriers or triggers. What I feel is, having traveled lots of parts of the country, the o and &M, the sustainability, and everything has to be categorized in three things. Water-rich villages, where the importance of the water is not much. You see? There the behavioral changes require, it might be different. And where the water is scarce, but they get it. In that point also. Where there is a scarce, like Rajasthan and all that, normally they will be, appreciating that also. So the behavioral changes uh, in common, I mean actually as far as the drinking water, ensuring the drinking water sustainability is concerned, we need to look into these aspects sir, actually. At least three categories, I feel so. Where the quality, quantity and other things will be ensured by the infrastructure itself. Behavioral Absolutely. changes is an important, that's what I feel sir. No, I, you are very right and as I mentioned, the behavioral change itself in isolation may not work. So we call it a social environment and physical environment. So social environment is largely a behavioral change. Physical environment, it means you are providing that services. So if there is no infrastructure, you can't change the behavior. If I say people to treat the water, but at least the water should come at the household level in the tap. So that both the environment need to be worked together. So currently the focus is the villages which are kind of have been implementation phase or in the ONM phase, there we are trying to look at this campaign might help in terms of building that kind of awareness and focusing on the behavioral change aspects. 
Karnataka, we have done in the northern Karnataka, specifically in the Yadgir district. We tested this. Yes, so Kalike is our associate organization, so we have already done that. Yeah. Yes, uh, Sundar. Okay. Uh, so another alternative, uh, so there are two propositions, which has three propositions, but the two were very strong. One proposition came is the happiness. Okay, so Pani Aayega Logo Me Khushali Aayegi. But happiness is a state of mind. It will always go up and down. So happiness Aayega, but happiness Jabi Sakta Hai. Whereas respect is the one which always would like, anyone would like to get a higher in the up. Ki respect mera badna chahiye. So it's more in terms of link with the progressiveness. So that's why these two different uh, hypotheses we used and tested on ground. And then we realized that this someone has a better connect and long-term sustainable um, connect with the communities. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Aditya, I'm a faculty here. Uh, yeah, it's really very good work uh, that you're doing. So this is different in the sense that the government is interested on the supply side, and now you are thinking of from the demand side, how do you, how do you go about improving the demand of safe uh, drinking water? So this is very interesting. So what I wanted to know more is uh, from your uh, field, uh, field work, what, what do you think are the typical barriers? Uh, what are the behavioral constraints uh, for safe drinking water? Like wh why is it that there is less demand for... Uh, okay, uh, so... Is there false beliefs? Is there like what... Uh, okay, what so, are the typical, yeah, so one specific... Uh, well, fine. So the value of water in terms of the quality is substantially low. And the reason behind, because people say ki ye paani hum baut saalo se pee rahe, usse humko koi fark nahi par So immediate and direct linkages on health is very, very low. Ki hum log isi baavdi se paani pee rahe hai, isi kue se paani pee rahe, humko kuch nahi ho raha hai. But they don't understand that the, whatever the instances they might be getting in the households, be it the diarrheal cases or other, they don't, they don't understand that linkage is very well. The second part, which you also understand, the chemical contamination is very much ignored. So there is a strong denial among the community about the quality parameters. So that is a, one of the biggest behavior, behavioral barrier we found it at the household level. Yes, Madhvi. Uh, actually, we have time for one more question. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks because we are in Karnataka. We have our none of some of our teams have traveled extensively in Karnataka, and we have found that there are a large number of Auro plants are actually being installed in all villages. People pay five rupees, get twenty liter water bottle, get it filled up, and go. So when we asked, and simultaneously, parallelly, these Jeljivan mission taps are also being given. And there is a least uh, interest to take the water from the taps. How do you make them drink from the tap through your BCC? Okay, so I think uh, one is one another which um, thing has come up as a kind of a distrust. One of the barrier which has come as a distrust. Ki if it comes from some specific source, I don't ever trust whether the I'm getting the right quality on that particular source. किसी ने पाइपलाइन लगा दिया, टंकी लगा दी, बोर से पानी आए, तो वो डिस्ट्रस्ट है, वो बिल्ड नहीं हो रहा है कि ये पानी साफ है या नहीं है। So unless and until we try and see that, and create that, you know, we remove that barrier about the distrust among the households, using different elements, and I'm not sure that only the behavioral change, only the one campaign will help. There may be a lot of other elements which might be required to ensure that this water is coming is safe, potable, and it will not having any harm on you. Uh, there is also a kind of a another misconception that the RO water is only good. I mean, and, and it's not only in rural, in urban also. In, in Bombay, we don't need RO water, but I think 70, 75% people use the RO water. So there are some misconceptions at the household, but I think the biggest is the distrust where, why I don't want to use the tap connectivity? Tap water, why don't? Because I don't have a trust on that water, which is safe or not. And because they know that the jahan se source se wo shayad se kharab hai, so there are a lot of physical environment which needs to be
change an address to ensure that the, uh, you know, uh, people start having a trust on what water coming out from the tap. Uh, it's not only the behavioral change, it's also linked with a lot of other elements which might need to be come into play by the uh, water committee. Thank you so much, Mr. Vaghela. Uh, and thank you, audience, for this enriching Q&A session. Uh, unfortunately, we are uh, running out of time. And if you have any questions, please note it down. We can have this later during lunch or during any other break. Moving on to the second context of the case study on technology-enabled operational and financial visibility of SVS through what institutions in Bihar, for which I would like to invite Mr. Pankaj Kumar, the program integrator of AKRSPI. A big round of applause for Mr. Kumar. We have 15 minutes for the presentation and five minutes for the Q&A session. Thank you so much, sir. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank IIMB and Jal Jeevan Mission for giving me the opportunity to present my works. These works are, can you project the PPT, please? Yeah. So there are some experiences in Bihar uh, which are slightly ahead from the states status in our other states because we have uh, the Hargar Naljal program was in, uh, you know, conceptualized and launched a little before JJM was launched. So there has been work from uh, there onwards and the o &M policy is also there. While many states are trying to formulate and bring a policy, the o &M policy in Bihar is there and uh, there has been effort to operationalize that policy. Because just bringing the policy doesn't mean that it gets operationalized and you know the experiences from there could be used at larger scale. And especially the need for that I see is very strong right now across the India. So uh, we'll share that experiences, yeah, uh, from our work in Bihar. This is not AKRSP work only. The ARGAM, WFP, we all are working together to achieve some meaningful objective which could be useful to wider audience across the states or at national level. So, uh, actually there is one caveat in Bihar that below Gram Panchayat there is another institution called Ward Implementation and Management Committee. This is a unique case for Bihar because this uh, committee has some constitutional mandate and there has been fund and functioner, functionaries decentralization to this committee. So this is one unique arrangement in Bihar. Other than that, uh, most of the things are common. I will go to next slide. Oh, from this. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So, uh, context in Bihar is that uh, there are close to 8,000 panchayats and uh, around 1.4 lakh watts. Watts are could be it's like habitations and uh, the scheme was launched in September 2016 but first two years was initially lost in some court disputes and all where Gram Panchayat had some objection with this committee having fund for implementing this scheme. Uh, our focus which I'm presenting today is you know in the district of Mujafarpur which is a, a district on the northern side of Bihar. It's a, a water wise it is a, a you know water rich district. And uh, we are focused in three uh, blocks of the, that district where uh, uh, we have been working on close to 550 schemes. So essentially it is 550 watts and it caters to around uh, 72,000 uh, households, approx 3.5 lakh population. So initially we were working with Panchayati Raj strongly because Panchayati Raj was implementing these schemes in non-quality affected areas. Well, PHED were uh, taking care of mostly quality affected area or multi-villages schemes, which uh, needed uh, bigger technical input or you know stronger tech, tech aspect of that. Uh, but later on, uh, Vihar cabinet decision has come this year that now PHED will take care of all the schemes across the state. Panchayati Raj will not be involved in this water sanitation aspect. So there has been a department shift and some confusion has come because of that, because the handover, the new guidelines and all that. 
but still uh, whatever our experience right now it all has been with PID work so that I would be sharing here and so uh, the uh, there was a ONM policy in Bihar it was brought in uh, uh, year 2021 around September 21 uh, and uh, the key provisions of the ONM policy is uh, listed over here Mainly, it uh, recognizes WMC as key uh, institution to do the operation maintenance aspect, means maintaining the records, doing the uh, minor repairs, or uh, collecting the tariff, doing the communitization practices like, you know, uh, convening Jal Chopal, discussing the issue, addressing the grievances, all of that is decentralized to uh, world level. And if there are issues which are not resolved there, it could be escalated at different level as there is a central grievance redressal system also present there. So uh, the, the annual financial provision is also there, although there are uh, lapses in that, uh, which we will be discussing later on. But uh, one key aspect has been that there is a dedicated anurakshak at each scheme. And since these are habitation based scheme, there is a direct visibility and accountability to that person. The person is present there, if water is not coming, I can go and ask him, I can catch him, why water is not reaching my home. So this direct accountability and visibility has been helpful to maintain that service level which has been envisaged. The monitoring earlier in PRD arrangement, it was through a technical assistant. Technical assistants are responsible for monitoring a cluster of panchats, like three, generally they were at four panchats, they are engineers basically. So, uh, although the uh, visualization was that they will help in community practices also, but they were more towards technical aspect of inspection. Their gauge of inspection was engineering driven. The centralized grievance redressal system is there, but then uh, the use of it by people is, you know, I refer to Divyang's presentation that the ownership and uptake, you know, means water rejects my home, good, not reaches, then also I'm not con much concerned. So the grievance part of it, like, you know, taking ownership that why it is not coming, it's my right, and, you know, escalating it to different levels, that is somehow low. Uh, the, there are, uh, have been effort to impanel agencies who can provide minor or major repairs to these schemes, depending on the situation, while minor repairs could be taken care at ward level itself. For major repairs, they needed to have an estimate prepared by technical assistants and seek panchayat's help or, you know, higher level for financial approvals. Uh, there has been effort to test water quality, but there was quite a lot of lag in this because uh, the two departments were at loggerhead with each other. PHED had the charge of kits, but the operations was to happen in PRD areas and it was not getting transferred at district level or it was lying on in the district panchayati raj office. Then we pitched in, you know, we brought both of them together, uh, trained some people and launched and all of that was taken care of and we could uh, do the pre-monsoon testing, now post-monsoon testing is also in the process. So it's just that, you know, the untying some knots works. While the policy provision is present, but then you need somebody to move things in the ground. Yeah. So we, we see uh, the uh, you know, ONM challenges in all four domains. So we have tried following this uh, you know, 4D framework. The physical challenges were like that. You know, uh, uh, the initial focus was on coverage. So there have been some compromises in terms of like the infrastructure, uh, you know, sub substandard construction or substandard materials. In both ways, you can say there have been issues. So the schemes, some schemes are very good, while some schemes at medium level, there are some schemes which needs quite a lot of attention in terms of infra and materials being put over there. The one basic thing was that these are small schemes, you know, supplying 100, 150 households. So uh, there is no need of, you know, uh, much of filtration or disinfection because there is a small distribution network. And so these things were ignored, uh, you know. Uh, but one uh, concept was that, that we are tapping aquifer which are relatively safer. We are going below 100 meters depth across Bihar. So uh, these aquifers are not contaminated. And anyway, water quality affected areas are, are taken care separately by another department. So that was one thing, and uh, the effective rollout or capacity building for frontline institutions, this was uh, uh, you know not prioritized at that time because they not only needed this uh, mandate, they also needed the 
the uh, capacity building in terms of first time technical and social requirements are there to manage pipe water supply system. So for PRI to have these capabilities, it needs quite a lot of input. Uh, these were uh, weak at that time. The review and guidance, you know, uh, has been uh, one bigger part because uh, only giving the funds but not reviewing it regularly leads to these kind of issues that where substandard construction can happen, it can go into contractor mode, community participation getting ignored, all that process. Uh, the tariff collection was initially not pushed. This is, you know, tariff collection has always been an unpopular thing, especially for, you know, to take decisions and operationalize it, nobody wants to make larger masses unhappy. <laughs> but later on, when the ONM policy came, it's a notional uh, thing because uh, it has not been considered as how much people are consuming and how much they are paying. It's just that at least let's get people into paying habits. So a uh, uniform tariff of 30 rupees per month was decided, but then there was no regular follow-up to you know review this. We have tried putting these the ONM provisions into practice in our area, and the results. Uh, we'll be discussing it's uh, surfaced from that interventions. So our theory was that if uh, uh, you know the benchmarks are regularly met, peoples have been given uh, you know service level regularly in adequate way, they will pay. That was our uh, concept, and we have uh, went forward to that uh, with community ownership. We have trained 540 anurakshak and uh, you know other members of WIMC on record keeping, major minor repairs, ONM policy. So all the, we have not added any extra thing. Whatever was there in the policy, we just simplified it, them, created contents for them and organized training. But was just organizing training is not enough. Then after hand holding and following them, that what is happening after the training. And the results are out there to see, you know, almost every panchay, uh, you know, every scheme has cleaned their tanks, uh, did disinfection measures. Uh, started tariff collection, the documents are maintained, all eight types of documents are maintained properly and precisely. They need hand-holding once in a week or once in fortnightly basis, you need to go and check if they are doing it correctly. But at least they started doing all of that. And there have been, uh, you know, tariff collections which has been regularly coming for 17 months, at least uh, close to 450 watts are regularly paying. There are some watts which will have, uh, you know, disruption in water supply and then you cannot go and ask for tariff when water is not supplied for a week or two weeks. That time, the WMC itself takes decisions away. This month, our water supply has been compromised. We'll wave off or we'll collect only half or we'll collect with next month tariff. So these decisions are taken. We also promoted local groups because the effort to impanel agencies, the agencies were expecting that we should get annual maintenance contract. And there should be a payment from centralized level. While the... Departments was thinking that no, WMC will, you know, pay you. So go and talk to them. Okay. So uh, we uh, created 14 local uh, groups who are providing these ONM services. Means whenever repair is required, they are getting a call or message and they go and sort out their services and WMC directly pays them. So their income have also increased and uh, the downtime have also reduced with that. So these are uh, a few crucial things which has acted as enabler in this uh, story. Uh, the first is existing state policy, which was very helpful. It was our guideline that, okay, we will go with this. We will try to operationalize this. Uh, people's valuing FSTC, you know, this has reduced our hardship, especially for women. This was really helpful. Even if male member refuses to pay, women starts fighting. No, I have to go and fetch water from that hand pump, which is 500 meter away. So what is this 30 rupees so big thing for you? Why don't you pay? <laughs> they will block the connection next time. So that's how it has been. Uh, the cooperation of government department, of course, the government has been amenable to issue the direction, letters, uh, assigning the people to walk with us in this journey. Uh, the technology has been one part where Argyam has supported us quite a lot. We have also working with Ega Foundation and we have operationalized all the capacity building uh, things through PDA. Uh, the tariff we are trying to get through M Gram Seva, which we are saying Pajal Bihar in you know in Bihar context. Uh, we are also uh, applied one technology to review and get visibility of task performed by WIMC, especially Anurakshak, that we are using through Abni. So the the changes observed is that almost 95% of the schemes are remaining functional, and. Uh, 90% are effectively functional. Effectively functional means our benchmark has been that at least for 27 days in a month, the scheme should supply water 
and whatever it's the six hours a day should be at least the supply three times daily morning two hours evening two and a half hours and maybe 45 minutes in the afternoon as per need the committee get decided but six hours they should give the supply the tank cleaning you know that the biang was saying that that there is uh, why people should drink water from this tap yeah there is a big distrust that this water is not clean and safe so demonstrate that experience to them inform them that this time we are going to clean the tank you yeah, know don't use water the water will have uh, disinfection chemicals let it flow for some time all that this has been also uh, you know uh, a tool for us to engage the community into this process and all of the schemes have uh, completed their tank cleaning it was not cleaned even once and the loose alluvial soil of north bihar there were uh, you know mud in the tanks 1 feet 2 feet deep when we went and tried intervening but now it has been institutionalized and every 6 month there are tanks which are being cleaned every 3 months also so uh, the we also found that lot of schemes are non functional just because the people are in ego that uh, incumbent don't want to hand over the charge to the new one and the, the nobody cares that it is handed over not is just functional that's okay for the government so uh, you know lot of community platform has been very useful where people discuss you know the old one the new one comes together and they discuss people intervene the gp chairman comes and the scheme is functional there was no issue with the scheme the issue was with people not interacting and trying to resolve the things so the in finances uh, you know uh, 450 wards are paying regularly there are wards which uh, goes down comes up and more than a 1 crore we have been facilitated to come through tariff most of it has gone on paying electricity bills minor repair bills and some anurakshak incentive because government whatever government mandated finance it has not come timely so still people are running it maintaining it through community legislation because uh, other maintainer also has a accountability they are directly elected by the people and they themselves are also beneficiary of this scheme so there are also traction for them to maintain and run this so these are the changes which has surfaced the wmc is functional the anurakshak are very confident and uh, community is engaged through these platforms we have been using these three tech components which i have already mentioned uh, i'm done now almost so uh, this this is how this our tech you know app looks like the page we have has nine tabs for uh, household to be listed household to be charged the demand to be generated and once the tariff is come they also send confirmation messages these are the tank uh, you know task which anurakshak does that's also we are capturing digitally tank ki safai wmc ki vadak jal chopal uh, you know the water supply log book and also water quality test done that is also captured here and the capacity building efforts are shown here then this heat map that how many people from which which area has been trained and they are available there to be used later on as a trainer or as a local champions to when we want to spread it to larger area they could be you know utilized that time these are the areas or improvement i you know said it here uh, there needs to be more focus on capacity in terms of like you know once you build the capacity means you do the training then you hand hold review and guide them just doing the training doesn't do the works it's just the one aspect of it that's one very important thing and there has been cadre gap you know uh, the people are there at block in engineering division and below that there is no people who can do the community part of it so if there it's one person comes who can be charge of few gp 4 5 gp the schemes can really work well uh, we have been doing this input our community resource person are there who are in charge of 40 50 schemes effectively 4 5 gps and they have been able to you know they are the first resort for anurakshak to reach whenever they have an issue we have digital contents to train them uh, the finances if it goes timely there is no problem but in government system the financial dispersion has been very delayed very very delayed for quite a a lot of schemes it had not reached especially onm funds and there is a provision to utilize fc funds from uh, gram panchayat but you don't know in onm what issue will crop up later on so how do you build up in gpdp that six month later our scheme will have pipe breakage so if it it remains free as that you can just part money for onm requirement of a scheme then 
it can be useful. But uh, there is a requirement that you specify for what and which issue you will be ut utilizing this. So these are some challenges. On physical aspects, source sustainability needs prioritization. Water safety aspects need, need a little more focus. Uh, measure of wastewater needs to be integrated in this model. So community values, FHTC, the WMC needs hand-holding. There is willingness from community to pay. It has been already demonstrated. If you, the supply is disrupted or the benchmarks are not met, they will not think twice also to reverting back to their, you know, uh, previous option. So simple technology can be key enabler. That's all. The detailed ONM guideline is very much needed. Regular handholding support, smooth reversal of finances, incentive to frontline worker, because nobody could put so much of labor and effort just for free or when they don't see the reward coming. So you need to value those people, incentivize or have a regular, you know, kind of something and put on simple technology. These are some stories from field. Thanks a lot. Any questions? I would appreciate. Each VWMC, 50 households, 100 households, small uh, yeah. habitation. 100 to 200. 100 to 200. <coughs> so, uh, so in, uh, for the, just uh, 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 to know, understand the scale, how many VWMCs were there in Mujaffar, uh, Mujaffarpur? 4,300. Around 4,000. Yes. So, uh, did we also try to rank those VWMCs in terms of performance because situation environment was same. Some of them might be performing very good and some may not be performing that. Yes. So, did we try that also? So, there has been effort to try, you know. Uh, we essentially uh, tried ranking these schemes in terms of, uh, you know, effectively functional, partially functional, non-functional. It also ties to the performance of WMC. Like how effectively they are meeting every month, if they are conducting Jal Chapal every month. So, on district level scale, uh, we have tried doing it, but then, as I said, that there is a gap. You know, there is nobody to do the focused following. And uh, in our intervention area, intervention area, we could do because we have CRPs who could be, you know. So if the guided review and mentoring is being instituted properly and somebody is there to review it regularly on interval, this can be done very easily on very large scale. But then it does not become priority or, you know, with regular posts, it happens once and then people leave this. So institutional follow-up is very important because CSOs, you know, the pressure could be only very little. And we also have limited resources and reach. In terms of, uh, now we have uh, platform. Right, sir. And uh, they have to improve their performance and improve their performance. Right. 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 And now at least at district level you can uh, know which VM, uh, VWNCs are collecting. Yes. And maybe we can develop some indicators based on them and then we can also ask VWMCs to add few more parameters to this platform and then we can make an indicator. I think that can help. So, so that as of now, I don't think there is a way to give <coughs> any kind of information from individual VWMCs that, is, that can be monitored at district level or state level. So actually we are in uh, visualizing that trajectory, sir. Uh, that, you know, the, once the trusted information and data is being generated and it is being visualized at each level, the people would try, they will, have value in this and try to you know use this for larger so yeah manu you want to add on yeah. please yeah. talk a lot about institution we talk about panchayat raj being responsible no place is there uh, and those who work with institutions know that all of them are not the same so we would categorize them into A, B, C, etc. But we don't do it systematically, we don't do it regularly, therefore our import, inputs are uniform, it doesn't make sense. The weaker institution require three visits, the ones which are already mature don't need a visit. But our state system 
is designed for equitable and pool thinly spread inputs. So I think categorization of each institute, whether WMC or Punjab, is key to making use of scarce resources for bringing everybody on the same level. That's going to be very key. I think the technology now being available, it becomes very easy to get. It's not just one time at a run time, because one time yeah. is easy, but doing it at one time multiple times, yeah. that will be the uh, My direct sister had taken it between Mujafur and Nagar, so hard now. Yeah, I visited this also. I contribute the success of these, I mean, actually 80% of, I didn't find 80%, I found out 80%. Only due to the other action, whatever we call that actually. Okay. It's not even the WMP because it's almost on the par with the VWC and the majority of the states VWC, they have a actual mandate and they have a constitutional rights also, etc. But they co-terminate along with the political existence of the body. Okay. So reality. So actually Anurakshaka actually it is important. But there I have found that actually the flow of funds <coughs> and generation of funds is not as he has done that. I may be wrong also because I have observed only 16 villages as well as mandated me. But a uh, uh, little more working and as he has told actually, it's a continuous monitoring sir. That is very important. We have to create a system for that. Uh, otherwise it will become an arbitrary and an island of a success. So it cannot be, I mean, extended globally or it cannot be ubiquitous. Actually, in any committee, there is one lead actor. In any film, there cannot be multiple heroes. There could be co-actors. So, Anurakshak is the hero of that film. And I, I appreciate that. Please. <laughs> Second question first. There is no basis to it actually. It's just the, uh, you know, people should start getting into habit of paying. That's all. Because all connections are non-commercial, non-metered. So there is uniformity, you know. Uh, we don't know who is using 500 liter, who is using 300 liter, right? But uh, water as a something of common resource, nobody wanted to pay for it. People were ready to fight that. Right. So, you know, the, uh, and it's a very unpopular decision to have tariff for water, you know, which generations have been using it for free, right? So, the minister, the chief minister of Bihar, honorable chief minister, he has said that at least let's start getting people into habit of paying. One rupee a day, it's a very notional amount. People can spend on anything. So just one rupee a day, visualize it is like that. Then also it adds up and it could take care of quite a lot of the things. And it has been. The finances are not coming to WMC, but they are able to pay electricity bill. They are able to take care of minor repairs. At some instances, and Rakshak are also getting some incentive out of it. So this one rupee a day has worked wonders. Water quality arrangements, uh, the kits and consumables are being purchased by PhD. Uh, the testing in respective departments were done by, you know, like in PID part, it would to be done by Anurakchak. In PhD, the PhD had their own arrangement. But then the problem was that kit handover and operationalizing it. Because the kit coming from PhD, the PID has no buy in for it. Okay, let it be there. So then we uh, in intervened. Uh, we trained one person in each GP who was a slightly smart Anurakchak to be a water quality tester also. And uh, we got all in Rakshak to get their samples at one designated place. He tested it. The FTK is very, really simple. It's called multi-parameter FTK. Five chemical parameters and one microbial H2S vials. Yeah, so that's how it is done. But it is being also reported to JJM website. Yeah. Any other? No, I'm done. If people are interested, I can't help. <laughs>
<laughs> so thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pankaj Kumar, for your valuable insights. I would like to invite Ms. Sujata Tripathi from WFP to present her views on managing drinking water infrastructure in West Bengal. A big round of applause for Ms. Tripathi. Uh, good morning to you all. And uh, I really extend my heartiest uh, uh, gratitude to all the organizers, organizers like uh, JJM and uh, IM Bangalore as Agyam for giving us the opportunity to share our work and uh, what we do. And it's basically I would be like to uh, share uh, today about the journey that uh, we had initiated in the year 2015-16 uh, on uh, demonstrating a model single village scheme and how from a model we in one particular district, uh, we replicated few more models in another district. And then at scale, we supported uh, the PHED to, uh, for the preparation of VAP at scale in one particular district. So from demonstration to a little bit of uh, gradual progress towards scale. Uh, so that would be our, I would be reflecting on that. So but before that, I think I'll just uh, uh, share about a brief, very brief about Water for People. Uh, so, uh, Water for People uh, actually emphasizes on uh, uh, like uh, re, uh, like uh, safe and sustainable water and sanitation and hygiene solutions for all. Uh, presently, we are uh, we have our implementation in uh, four states: that is uh, Bihar, Maharashtra, West Bengal, and Assam. Uh, we have a presence in nine districts and 11 blocks. Uh, but in West Bengal, we have intensive presence in uh, five blocks in uh, two districts, one municipality uh, at the local level uh, impact. And as well as the interesting thing is that we presently, uh, like recently, we have been supporting the uh, PNRD department, uh, the service authority at the state level and PHED in two districts uh, as a technical support unit. And we've been able to reach around 2.6 million people. But uh, majorly, we are working in close collaboration with the uh, local uh, communities, with the uh, government stakeholders at the state and the district and the block level. And we are a sector partner of the National JJM. Uh, we work very closely with uh, the knowledge and technical partners and the other CSR and international donors are also supporting in our work. So as I was sharing uh, basically about uh, uh, the single billet scheme, uh, the intervention uh, location where we actually demonstrated this model uh, in the year 2015-16, it is in Digambarpur Gram Panchayat. So this Gram Panchayat has received uh, the best Gram Panchayat award in, uh, uh, like in India. Uh, because of the visionary leadership of the president of the Gram Panchayat for his uh, dedicated services on water and sanitation, along with that, other development works are also there. So this uh, scheme was uh, like, uh, uh, it is like, uh, we have, when initially in the year uh, we started, we uh, reached around 385 families around, but uh, after that, we do not have direct support uh, to the Gambarpur uh, Gram Panchayat because the project has ended at that point of time. But still, they, with their own initiative, has extended few families. So now, like the, uh, it's like 426 families are uh, getting uh, water from uh, the household connections. Uh, we invested uh, around like uh, one crore 65 lakhs, but that is the entire project cost, like uh, human resource and travel and everything, all the admin and everything uh, for this particular project. And the interesting thing or that I need to highlight is basically uh, the community owned and managed system. Now we are talking in 2019 when we launched this JJM, everything is there in the policy. But before that, in the, in the year 2015-16, we majorly, majorly tried to build this model, uh, emphasizing on the community ownership and community managed with the tariff system. Uh, now we all know that uh, uh, tariff system and metering is right now, uh, there is, uh, I don't think so, it is there in West Bengal and West Bengal uh, doesn't promote this tariff system as a part of the policy. But still, uh, where we have intervened with the support of the local government, we have been able to create that model, not only in one, this Digambar program Panchayat, but in seven other uh, uh, Gram Panchayats in different districts we have. Uh, the PhD department appreciated the model, but in policy, it is still not there. So, and the uh, uh, most important fact is uh, infrastructure, it can happen, definitely. Anybody, like, can do that infrastructure, we can have. But the, interestingly, the community part, the process, the journey, 
how from the beginning we are involving the community, the local government in the process of planning, which is there mentioned in the guidelines as well. How we are involving them at each and every process, right from planning the DPR, the uh, like uh, DPR in the sense like uh, especially coming up with uh, you know the the planning process, and then uh, the designing part, then the co-financing part. Who who supports the community contributing uh, the excavation, the pipeline excavation work, and the local government, the community is also providing land, donating land to the gram panchayat, the gram panchayat making arrangements for electricity. It's it's a part of the entire process, the journey that has been who is doing what and then how till the process we hand over to the gram panchayats. Then uh, obviously the operation and maintenance like uh, involving uh, the uh, not uh, forming a new committee but the existing like the self-help groups who are there in that particular village who have been strengthened, the VWSCs who have been strengthened. So how they all are connected with each other and how they are uh, supporting and ensuring the functionality of the system is important. So we, we feel good about it when we now also if we go but generally what happens um, when a project ends uh, generally you know like after one or two years we still have uh, like uh, uh, the functionality of the systems is sometimes uh, a question but uh, now also if you go in the year 2015-16 we completed the project if we go now if we visit but still it is functioning that is uh, the best part of the program so uh, uh, basically on the scheme management size uh, that time in south 24 parganas uh, in district of south 24 parganas uh, it's basically the groundwater source that has been used um, that time it was like 960 feet uh, the water layer we used to get uh, the water quality presently we are like the gram panchayat is testing two times a year with uh, the chlorination as well uh, at regular chlorination every two months uh, then the operation and maintenance committee, that is the water sanitation committee, which the SAG group is actually managing. Uh, they are also active and they are still functioning. Uh, the VWSC is also, we have strengthened the VWSC and the Jalabandhu as a service provider. We identify a few local youths who, uh, who are like, uh, we call them uh, the friends of water. They are mobile hand pump, uh, like mobile water mechanics. So initially they used to, uh, uh, you know, like uh, for hand pump mechanic, but they were also skilled in plumbing work as well. So that they can uh, still support the Gram Panchat, but the Gram Panchat piped water is a new, uh, like the household connection is there, but still there are many sources, the hand pump are there which are defunct so even those sources are also uh, they are taking care of that so apart from that, uh, so uh, the, the, the interesting thing is that the tariff collection is still happening and it is not based on some kind of uh, economics like how much uh, you know the cost is and how but it is a voluntary uh, contribution which the community is giving. Uh, initially when we started it was around 30. So now the, each family is giving around 50 rupees. So that is the contribution and in, uh, if you see the financial side uh, with that contribution it is uh, actually meeting up the cost of 52% something but the rest of the cost is managed by the Gram Panchayats and the PhD as well. So, and there are two caretakers. The caretakers, especially I want to highlight is that they are the uh, families who have donated the land to the Gram Panchayat. So they have involved them as caretakers who can uh, take care like uh, in different shifts, uh, the pipe water uh, schemes. Oh yeah, the challenge, uh, the current challenge that uh, after uh, like JJM has been launched and the program that we have demonstrated is in uh, West Bengal, uh, water is free, there is no tariff, but uh, in the models which we have demonstrated, we have introduced this tariff in the same like the voluntary contributions coming from the households. So there nowadays the people are questioning the Gram Panchayats that if uh, other households are not paying, then why we will pay? So few families are reluctant, but the Gram Panchayat president is very positive about it. So he will be conducting meetings because it depends like how we actually uh, involve the community. We train them, we, uh, uh, you know, sensitize them towards this owning the system, the operation and maintenance part. And uh, electricity is always a challenge. So for that, uh, they are, uh, they have uh, installed some solar, solar panels uh, so that uh, like high cost of electricity is a uh, little bit taken care of. And, but still, the dependency on hand pumps uh, for drinking water is there, definitely. Gradual, it's a gradual behavioral change uh, process uh, that uh, you mentioned. It's, it, it will take some time, definitely. So overall, uh, the piped water, uh, like the model which we have done and then uh, replicated in few other, uh, like in one of the districts uh, in Birbhum, in seven uh, other schemes, so overall, these challenges, which we in the morning also, I, I will not repeat that, but it's it's uh, we have already discussed. So it's similar. We have we are seeing that in the field, 
It's like the lack of convergence. Still, the institutions needs to be strengthened. The VWSC, the SAGs, who can be, play a very important role in this o &M and also in water quality and the service providers uh, also. So those uh, kind of uh, uh, things have to be done. And most importantly, uh, the visibility of the service providers, the frontline workers, who is doing what at the ground level. It's not uh, me or somebody else or the NGOs who are working at the ground, but the resources, the pool of resources there at the village, if it is VWSC, then who, we, who um, there are so many members in the VWSC. The Nirvan Sayaks are there, the president is there, the SAGs are there, the other ASHA workers is there, but then who, who is given to do what? The functionaries, the basically. So that, that component is still uh, some, something we have to figure out, like how do we actually uh, support them. So, and the resources are there, the lack of convergence we can see because uh, we talk about source sustainability, the water resource department is working on that, the JJM, like uh, the PhD is working on that, the PNRD is also working at the Gram Panchayat level. So how can uh, whatever work we do, different organizations work at the ground level. So how can we bring them, how, how we can actually create a platform where these uh, source, the pool of resources are visible to them so that they can make use of those instead of every time, you know, coming up with different kinds of planning. The JJM comes up with a VAP, uh, the SBM2 comes up with an AIP, the WRD comes up with some, let's say in the same village, in the same Gram Panchayat, there are so many different plans. How we can, how the data can be come together so that it is not duplicacy of, you know, work. So uh, one plan, people can refer that. These are the resources, they can make use of that. So there, so... Uh, so this is what I said that from model building at local level, how we are moving towards uh, at scale, it's majorly the institutional strengthening that we are focusing on. So the enablers are basically what uh, helped us, you know, for the scale to introduce the scale at the PhD level is the digital uh, technology that we had used. Uh, that is, uh, I think AKRS, we also shared about that. That's a participatory digital attestation. So uh, in, those, in that attestation, the, the interesting thing is that we have captured the journey. So coming up with the functional grid, like who does what, then the process, the, uh, like uh, as per the guidelines, what needs to be done, what are the different things that needs to be done under the VAP, the VAP, like the social map, resource map, the village profiling, everything in, in the process, and who is doing what, and those data. So it is there in the platform itself, and uh, the people, like the, you know, we have made use of, we have identified with the help of uh, uh, the mission director, or the DM, and the ADM of a district, to identify the cadres, like at the district level, who will be the master trainers at the block level, who will be responsible at the gram panchayat level, who will be there. So this is how the training of the master trainers are going right uh, down. So this is what, and with incentives, right now, uh, one of my, like, uh, my friends spoke about it. So intensive also, incentives not very much defined. So, but uh, through this uh, approach, like, we had been able to uh, mobilize uh, the mission director and all. So he uh, released incentives for uh, the people who are uh, involved in the entire process of uh, collection of data for village action plan. So you can see a little bit of achievements that you can see that uh, in capacity building, one model we have uh, in uh, Digambarpur and now like we have been training in another district uh, with uh, 19 engineers and uh, like uh, ISAs on JJM and as well as uh, so many sessions done. The digital contents are available for the master trainers, for the grassroots workers who can refer those digital trainings and can pass on uh, to the message to the community because it's not only the frontline workers, the community also needs to be sensitized for these uh, programs and uh, the data which were there, like collected by the people of the community itself, those data are used by the district and the block for uh, making their plan or for decision making. And also, as a part of the, uh, like we, uh, whatever people also at the district level, they're part of the ICBCC committee as well, so that they can uh, support in the rollout plan. Uh, as I already shared that uh, the data, uh, uh, the, like the program actually, we uh, helped us in coming up with verifiable and real-time trustable data that can be used uh, especially in the planning process and also at the decision making. Mostly uh, important is the community engagement, how the people in the community, it's not the ISAs, we talk about ISAs, we talk about PR, like uh, the KRAs. It's one-time training at the KRA level, one-time, two-times training. The ISAs, they fill up the data, I mean like the... 
Uh, they're supposed to be in the guidelines. It's mentioned that the community involvement should be there. But sometimes uh, these processes are missing. The ISA fill up the data and then just, uh, you know, like uh, uh, because the, uh, I can say that uh, because the coverage has to be shown or the target has to be met. So going after the target, so missing out some important components or missing out those processes uh, sometimes. So but who validates the data? So who validates the VAPs? But the, it is there. Like 2,000 VAPs have been done. But who validates it? those kinds of uh, mechanism and who has done it. So all those processes somewhere is we found to be missing in our uh, journey when we actually support it. Uh, so I would just highlight maybe uh, the challenges which are still unresolved is the o &M policy at the state level. It is there, but uh, it is there in the sense just maybe two, three pages kind of mandate type. It is there that uh, the, uh, you know, that the contractors will take care of the major repairing and the block videos and the gym. But, but the standard like operating procedures, like how it will be, how we can make use of uh, uh, involve the SAGs or the detailed out of the, um, the SOP of the o and is still, I think, needs to be emphasized. And uh, especially on the behavior change, we talk about behavior change, but uh, collecting few uh, photographs, you know, with GIS location uh, doesn't solve the uh, problem. We have to see that whether the behavior actually has been changed or not. How do we do that? Are we tracking that? So how we can uh, track all these, uh, the actual work that is happening on ground. It's just not just figures or numbers, but I just wanted to highlight the process that we had followed in our local demonstration, whether that process we are trying to see in different uh, scale, at scale, whether we, we, we can see that, we can monitor that, we can track that, because that will ensure ultimately sustainability and also the identification of cadres. It's not outsourcing, you know, like ISAs or uh, NGOs, like uh, many organizations coming in, but we have to uh, invest especially on uh, the community uh, engagement, community involvement, the local stakeholders, how they, we can all come together and uh, work together for ensuring the sustainability of such programs. So I think I'm on time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please raise it. Thank you so much. And so glad to hear that uh, in a street like West Bengal, where, where the Gram Panchayats are able to collect the water carry. Yes, this yes, is yes. An amazing experience. And thank you so much for that. My question is like you have already highlighted this is not working, I think. Working? It is working. Okay. So basically, there are three, four areas what uh, we have been experiencing almost like across the country. We are talking about institutional arrangements. And uh, there are uh, like states like Madhya Pradesh, I'll give you an example, where Madhya Pradesh has taken a conscious decision, the state government, to integrate Gram Panchayats with VWSCs and SHGs. Because uh, we could able to see there are a lot of friction between these three institutions. And many of my colleagues, they have already talked about how do we bring in institutional sustainability. Because if you look at the financial utilization also, the panchayats have been given the responsibility for utilizing the 15th Finance Commission Fund. 60% of the 15th Finance Commission Fund could be utilized for operation and maintenance, 30% in under under uh, uh, sanitation and 30% in rural water supply. What is happening that the moment the panchayats are not involved in th into this process, they are saying we are least interested as far as the utilization of fund in rural water supply system is concerned. So therefore, government of Madhya Pradesh purposefully, knowingly, they have made the chairperson of the VWC as the Sarpanch, number one. And they have also brought in 25% reservation for the elected representative of Gram Panchayats in VWSC. This is one component. The other component is the, uh, like, like as far as the JJM national guidelines are concerned, 50% of the uh, reservation for women in VWSCs. So they have also put in a provision that uh, many of the SHG's members will also represent in, in uh, VWSCs. So therefore, I would also like to know how do you see in West Bengal, because West Bengal, the PRIs are the most vibrant uh, institution in, in the state of West Bengal. West Bengal, Kerala, these are the states where the PRIs are very vibrant, and they are, they are the real kind of leaders who can take the decision on behalf of Gram Panchayats. So this is one area. The other area, what are your experience, as you rightly pointed out, that uh, some components has been utilized by, uh, from the tariff collected from the Gram Panchayats. 
uh, through the households. The other component is you said uh, PHED and uh, Gram Panchayats have also contributed to that fund. But as far as PHED is concerned, to the best of my knowledge, PHED doesn't have the O&M budget component as far as the, uh, this, this entire scheme, JJM scheme is concerned. It is only the Gram Panchayats and through 15th Finance Commission that has been utilized. So what are your experience in these areas? One is institutional arrangement and natural integration of these institutions in West Bengal. This is one area. The second area is how the funds have been utilized for operation and maintenance. And third aspect, what we have been debating and I have been doing this training across the country and we found that key when we are talking about handing over the schemes, uh, what I was talking to sir also in the morning during tea break, that uh, in the single village water supply scheme, we are talking about handing over the scheme for operation and maintenance to the Gram Panchayat, and sir has already mentioned whether they have the capability, whether they have the financial ability to handle this kind of a schemes. So these are the three areas I would like to hear from you. Thank you. Very good questions you have asked. Uh, so firstly, relating to the Alaska, I'll start with the first question, like the third question which you talked about, the handing over of assets to the Gram Panchayats, uh, the VWSCs. So in West Bengal, initially, when uh, the piped water scheme through standpoints, not through household connections, but that point of time also, the handover was to to the, the VWSC. But the experience is that the VWSCs are not that skilled. They are not that capacity. The capacity is not that much to actually, uh, you know, work on this, uh, the functionality or ensure the operation and maintenance of that. Because of which, again, the responsibility is switched over to the PhD. So now, again in JJM, we are talking about strengthening of the VWSC and handing over to the VWSC. So that part, and initially also, the, though we talk about handing over to the VWSC, but the fund, the fund doesn't come to their account. So how they will do? One is capacity, one is the funding. So those kind of, and capacity, when we talk about capacity, it's not the one-time training, right? So I, I come like how we build the organization as a team. Like we, we, we are a team and in an organization. So organization invests in, our, in the team, you know, to build their capacity. It's a continuous process. So that's how we see the uh, change. But in the community, it's like some mandates are there, you know, like training has to be given. So if the training is for one time, two time, how will the VWSC get to know? It's just, I mean, if you think of their capacity, it's just DJM speaks about X, Y, Z, and you have to do. It's just like some mandate flowing from the ministry to the state and then the district and the gram panchayat. So those components, like regular support, the guided mentoring support, so those kind of support if we try and building uh, with the, at the gram panchayat level, so that would be more useful for ensuring that uh, sustainability part. And you talked about the SAGs. Yeah, various departments, WRD comes and say we have to involve SAGs for X work. PhD comes and say they are very integral, uh, like uh, they can be uh, like used for uh, the O&M for water quality testing and X, Y, Z, for behavioral change, we can make use of them. So the PhD, the PNRD comes up with some, but the SRLM says that where is, who is defining the incentives for them? At least how much voluntary work they will be doing, how much load they will be take. Other, apart from these works, they are involved in other works as well. So we have to fix up uh, those uh, mechanism. So apart, then you talked about uh, the financial uh, something about that. So that kind of utilization, uh, I mean, like in VWSC, you see that uh, the panchayat elections, then again, new body comes in. So again, we have to reorient them. So there are the its own challenges. That's why we always speak about having resources from the community, from the ground pool of resources who can, even if the organizations are there or not there, but they are there to actually render these services. So those kind of, uh, plus data, yes. So if there is a proper data is there, like sometimes what happens, I give a data, like as an, uh, maybe an, as an I say, I give, okay, this percentage is, is done, coverage. When it goes to the state district or something, it, it then uh, gets some other data you can see. When it goes to the ministry, some other data. But what is the validity or the trustability of the data that can be referred by different departments? That is what it convergence, that the data are being used. There is no duplicacy of work because the frontline workers, how many, the same kind of work they are doing in the GPDP as well. If you see, when the GPDP planning is happening, those people are there planning. They are coming up with a water sufficient village plan. They are coming up with, with all the themes uh, which is there in the GPTP and all. So even water, uh, this JJM component, if you see the guidelines, or the, this, that is also part which is there in the like water sufficient village about source sustainability, about uh, these things. So how can we actually, you know, make 
that happen. So we have to think beyond uh, like just delivery of services. I mean, it's done, no? I mean, thank you. I mean, <laughs> or so we much. can connect sometime at the coffee or of whatever. Of course, we will be for, continuing yes. the questions later thank on. You. Thank you so much. A big round of applause for Mr. Patel. <laughs> Moving on to the next presentation, we have Mr. Krishna Kumar T. He is the Vice President of eGovernments Foundation and he will be presenting on financial sustainability of schemes managed by PHED in Punjab. A big round of applause for Mr. Krishna Kumar. Thank you so much, sir. We have 15 minutes for the presentation and 5 minutes for Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And it's a very learning experience for me when I heard so many presentations before, before this. And one thing I realized is the commit, committees, village committees are not doing some transactional job. They're actually running a mini utility. It has the human aspects around There's customers that they have to take care of. There are operational aspects of how they want to manage their water f tanks, facilities, running the operations, managing the day-to-day -day it's amazing. I think the complexities are immense, and this forum probably brings together many of those things together to make sure sustainability happens. So I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes sort of summarizing some of Ego's effort over the last two, two and a half years in the state of Punjab to, sus to enable how visibility can be enabled for sustainability. The focus will be on how we help tool that thing, and I want to straight up front. While technology enables many things, the implementations on the ground, the people taking ownership, those remain some of the pillars around which technology can support all the activities around that. So the way I'll cover it is just give a context of it, do the solution overview, and then I'll give you the spoils of stakeholders or some of the things that we achieve and some of the learnings along the way that we had, and what kind of thing JJM way forward is the tooling happens there. So basically, we got into this whole thing when we had the discussion with the state of Punjab, when the finance department was, I mean, they had a fiscal shock off. I mean, it was the end of the year, 400 crores pending bill that came from the public uh, the electrical department. And this particular thing was the trigger point to say that, and we. After this, we tried to understand what the issues were from the different stakeholders' perspectives. So we had, on one hand, the, the public water committees at the lower level. Then we had the Department of Water that's there, the Power Utilities, and FD. There was basically one, there was no collections happening. People were, and even if they were collecting, it was very inadequate. Second, the de Department of Water did not know what was the amount of money being collected, what the amounts of in, uh, expenditure, they, were there, they had low visibility. And then the uh, electrical utility were saying that nobody has paid me my bills. And then this guys had a final shock there. So, that, that the basic thing. so when, you, when we dug deeper, sorry, yeah, when we dug deeper and tried to understand from the, at the ground level what the issues were, there were several things that happened on the ground which uh, we captured. One is the citizens felt that People come and collect money, and they do not trust the ledgers that were maintained. This is last month you did something, now this month is different. Second, they also were disputing the, uh, uh, what is the ledger records, and they had uh, complaints about the water regularity, quality, etc. as well. So there was a sort of reluctance and you know, acceptance to pay as well. Second is, we also understood from the, the way they maintained the ledger. We saw the ledgers they had fairly cumbersome, maintaining it, computing on a monthly basis, updating it. So they had that. And also they were, t they were carrying all the ledgers to different places, updating it. And, and it was all individually maintained. Nobody was supervising them, no, no guidance, etc. And there were mistakes that were happening as well. Then the, the treasurer who was supposed to look at the incomes and expenses for the scheme from the committee uh, had limited visibility in the collections. And he, he had accumulation of liabilities that was happening. And uh, the committee were not able to, even though they were 
told that they should be sustainable. The aspiration was there to become sustainable, but they had no way to get handle around that. So the first phase that we uh, went through was we had covered around 8 lakh consumers. This was the scope that we laid out there, 8 lakh consumer connections, and 50 divisions of Punjab. Uh, the, this has around 4,300 or schemes, and the power connections were around 4,000 plus, and citizens covered was around 6 million. So we actually put together a solution, which is the platformized solution, which sort of brought together an aspect, and we designed it in such a way that it's like a platform, so that many things can come future as well. We made it very scalable and evolvable kind of a thing. And the solution had the rigid iFix platform, which is the core, at the core. And then we, since they had no systems, like the transactions cannot be completed, they had no app, etc. we built this app. It's called the Mgram Seva app. And this Mgram Seva app was able to generate demand, collect, track, and all that. And then there were power corporations who were able to put their bills onto this system automatically. And therefore, this gave the visibility to all the stakeholders, the finance department, water, etc., and also the rural uh, body committee and all, what their fiscal positions were. They were able to see all this together. So it's also possible that tomorrow you may need sanitation, say solid waste management you want to collect. So instead of Mgram Seva, you may have another app or an extension of Mgram Seva which can help you to do that as well. Without changing anything, the visibility can still come for you. So there are methods to become scalable by doing a few things like this. So this is how the sort of app looks like. We had the, so everything was done on a mobile app. There's no desktop kind of a thing. We, we know that people are on the ground, they're doing their job, and it's all enabled on the things. And it was multilingual enabled. And, it's, and look, people can share, share the reports. They can share their diagrams, et cetera, to people. Then they can also track consumer uh, satisfaction as well, and you can see a trend and some basic details about how much was collected, etc. So this is a Punjabi localization that is enabled for them. So with the with this, the uh, bill collector can go and collect all the monies from different people, and he can search the people and do it, and get all the details around that uh, using this, and then they can easily provide the snapshot of all the collections etc. to the panchayat there. So this is the operations of the expenses. So you can easily, very simple simple screens, very user-friendly screens for people to just capture their expenses. And they have a simple dashboard on the expenses. They can say how much total expenditure amount unpaid, then which are bills paid, burning bills are how much, what are the breakdowns of this, right? Electricity and all that. So with this a simple presentation, people can have a look at it in a simple manner. Then all these things come together in the form of the village pen uh, the collectors who, who is issuing the receipt to the citizens, the committees which are taking decisions, they have this in, there and they, the, the, the receipt there, and, and there's a big visibility to all the departments there and also the power department. So this is possible. So these are some dashboards that we built along the way. They can see the trend, find out whether they are on track or not, and these are all real-time dashboards. So at this point in time, we have rolled out this uh, into, uh, this is Anandpur Sahib, so we have rolled it out into uh, consumers, the 533 consumers are there, 337 consumers are already on board, and we also have generated for these number of households are uh, there. And you can see that the increasing trend of collections have happened, and this year we are almost maintaining the same level of collection level as that. So there's a p possibility to see it, and it also shows that if they give it more imp impetus, they will across the previous year's number there. Similarly, at the Punjab level, uh, out of the 4,072 villages which are targeted, uh, 2,337 villages are already live. The th another 1,300 uh, villages are right now putting their master data entry rates and config their users, etc. Uh, and we have close to uh, one, uh, 17, 1.7 lakhs uh, connections which are already onboarded here. So, so we, what we see is here, once this whole thing got done, there are three, four things that becomes visible as a change on the ground for people. One, the citizens get notification as soon as the bill is generated. And the bill is generated at the click of a button for the entire village. Okay? And they get notification of how much is the amount, and they get it on SMS and WhatsApp. Then they, also, they get instant receipt. 
Now when they, the, the collector, when he goes, he can also print instant receipts and hand it over to them. The bill collector now is able to generate demand easily for him. He records payment against those demand itself. So he knows exactly, he doesn't need to worry about accuracies, calculations, and all that stuff. Then the consumer tracking is easy for him, and he prints the bill immediately. So he builds trust in the, with the entire system there. He can, and the treasurer can see all the collections, et cetera, and he can make recommendations to the committees to take decisions on the payments, et cetera, as well. The village committee, the, the advantage was, because they are able to look at all this data at a single point, they are armed with better information to go and negotiate with the water department or other agencies for, for the sudden expenses, et cetera, and say, okay, we are performing so well, but still we have those expenses. They, they have those kind of a, a negotiating power because they're armed with data when they go there. So this is some of the things that you can see there, how their lives change from a sheer visibility perspective. This is the, this is the printer that they issued the bills done. And it bills shows clearly which period they are paying, which period they're not, all those are shown. So the traceability for the citizen exists. He doesn't feel that he's being unnecessarily taxed or something like that. And this is another form of the bill where this section is actually, uh, if, you, if the village chooses to, they can share all the expenses they are incurring for their scheme to be visible to the citizen along with their bill. So it brings in transparency and there's a potential to increase trust in the entire system because of this particular section that is there. Not many people are using it, but who are, have decided to use it, they are having this capability to use it in the system. These are some of the stories from the ground. Um, one of the secretaries there, he says, we, this is a very small village of only 84 households. And they were looking at the data and finding that they are in inadequate in their uh, ability to sub sustain. They increased their tariffs from 150 to 100. And this is another uh, village where they were uh, they have a very organized way of looking at all the people who don't pay and during the committee meetings and then they issue a notice with two weeks time for them to pay and if they don't then two people from the village committee go to the houses and because of sheer moral pressure that get built up people tend to pay so their collection of efficiencies have gone up and uh, in the Harminder Singh they are, they, they have been able to create some surplus funds and over the accumulated surplus fund they were able to buy a gen set for their usage as well. And uh, here people have said oh, across the entire Anandpur Sahib place they have been able to move from a less than 60% collection to greater than 90% collections. And that's, those are some of the stories from the ground. So some of our learnings in the implementations are like, uh, these are some of the points were covered in the previous presentation as well. One is the BRC, the block representatives, these are, these are very crucial. When you do a thing like that probably getting them involved right from the beginning and addressing some of their concerns will be a good thing to do because that helps implementation of things like this very uh, yeah, there. Second is they, they are the people who handle and provide training and provide day-to-day -day support. So their involvement upfront is a very important thing to achieve. Second is many times the, when the things get handed over to the villages, we have found that those are not very properly done in the sense the committees are not set up fully, the, the committees have not taken ownership of the things. So this causes a lot of delays. And, and that particular thing, if you are able to create a much more robust handover mechanisms, we also found some cases where the serpent changes and there's no handover. So monies remain with different people and so kind of use. So if we sort of create mechanisms which are much more, simply it will be useful for that. And of, we also face a lot of significant challenges with the data communication that <laughs> happens from multiple systems. So if, when we want to roll out things like this, tackling these kind of issues up front will be great. And again, as I said, you told you, the uh, technology is one part. The other parts are significant. And once those things align, technology can actually make life easier for people to do that. So with JJM, Jaljavin mission, this is the way forward. This digit iFix platform and mgram seva is available for states to adopt. And further, JGM is set up a national instance for Naljal for the states to use it. And interested state can implement the JGM director for the, and identify the way forward. We'll also be setting up a national PMU team for assisting the adoption into be in place. And the SOPs for different states will be evolved and those have to be trained people on that. So this is what the way forward is. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> so uh, we have been trying to use M Gram Seva in Bihar. Uh, as a, a program manager, I uh, myself feel that you know this system is built more with a perspective of delivering you know the people actors in the program. But what is the community perspective of it in terms of like we generate uniform bill or you know we send the confirmations? But uh, is there a way to integrate community grievances into it? Because as you have already integrated electricity part of it, if that gets integrated in Bihar, 50% of a scheme issue gets solved because there are a lot of electricity related problems. There are meters but no bill coming. There are bills pending for years. All those kind of things. So a lot of it, our people don't know how much is my bill. So, because sitting here in Bangalore or Delhi, we can imagine that people have that understanding and information. While information availability at ground is a totally different scenario. So, uh, that is a great help. But, you know, if people could request that uh, water has been not coming to my home or water coming is not of, you know, satisfactory level. So, make my connection inactive for the instance. I'm migrating from this village. So if this kind of concerns could also come into that, that would be a great enhancement or addition. I don't know what to call in software terms. But, uh, you know, uh, and the banking part of it. Uh, so I don't know if those features would be available in our area also, but uh, this would be great help. So thank you for that. But I really wanted that if something, you know, some of it request from community could be, you know, tapped into, while the uh, permission for it could be granted at a higher level. That would be a great help. Thank you. We have a, uh, we have a public grieving system that's already uh, mm -hmm. available on the DG platform. Uh, if somebody wants to implement it, probably we should look at that and see how we can use, do, use it for your purpose. Global. So I think the, uh, the the software and the technology is there. Uh, we'd love to work with you from a from a larger community perspective. It, we also have a feedback mechan feedback kind of a module. So if we can do a workshop to understand what are the needs of the community, not just from a complaining perspective, but also from a providing input to the you know the, the whole planning process. Also, we'd love to collaborate on that. But I'll again say that please think about an institutional mechanism. You can give voice to the citizens. It's easy, but how do you you know, uh, fulfill or kind of uh, close what they what they raise. Absolutely, absolutely. But the capacity to, I think, I'm saying somebody sure. says, Manu, we can, Manu, Manu knows both the domains; he can answer that. So, uh, so do the uh, this uh, uh, village level committee has powers to uh, uh, stop the connection if bill is not being paid? How that is handled? And in your case also, whether the VWMCs uh, do uh, disconnect? So, has it actually? Does it actually happen on ground also? There's a mechanism they can deactivate it so that next bill also doesn't go to them and they're actually here. Now the centering, the communities are earlier it was not so much centering. Now they are centering the community. Because uh, when we had an interaction with uh, some of the PDOs, they given a list of the uh, committee members. We called the people. The people they tell them, oh, I don't know, I am not in the community who told like that they are telling. Now when JJM initiated, the, when they taken seriously, the committee is existing seriously now. If they could have earlier, it was strengthened, it could have functioned very well. This is the main thing. So now people are paying dish bill and everything easily because they're getting exactly that uh, system flow to the ground level. Like that, the systems are not ground level strengthened. I 
I'm, I'm asking a question which is addressed to you, but also to you, is that if this makes sense, and it's making sense in Bihar, if it's making sense in Punjab, what does it take for, me, for us to make sure that it happens everywhere? Because it's very logical. If there is no money, and irrigation departments have been focusing on this for a long time, because irrigation recovery, water recovery, has been a major determinant of, of non-OLM, right? So in irrigation, the, the correlation is very, very clear. People pay because there is an economic value to the water. Drinking water is still a, a sort of a free good type of thing. So if you had to push states to take this up across states and, and, and simplify it, because everything else is digitized and this is the only thing which is still very, very primitive. Uh, would there, at a policy level, what the irrigation department did is that states which did not have a increased water rate policy if you remember 2000, uh, 20, 20, no, 2018 or 2019, the GOI said that if the states come back for refinancing of irrigation schemes, only those states which have adopted measures of increasing water charges will be given refinancing. Those states which have not will not get refinancing. That shifted every state in a matter of two, three years to increase the water rates. Okay, so can we at a government of India level say that, you know, this is there, we are telling you to use it, but you know, some are, some are not, it makes sense. So next time you come for more JGM financing or for O&M funds from government of India, if you don't do it, there'll be, a, there'll be an incentive, disincentive to adapting some of these e-governance measures. Otherwise, you know, it will always be some state at some point of time <laughs> doing something and not doing something, we can't move forward. Isn't it, actually? Uh, can you just explain how you managed that and actually what is the extent of um, correctness of the data you are ensuring? There are two mechanisms that are there from the system's perspective. See, most of the systems we have a mechanism to do a maker, checker, approver kind of a thing. Uh, checker, approver, right? That's, that, that, but, but here, in this particular instance, we have enabled only the creator part of it and there's a treasury and supervisor kind of a thing to up Okay, that all the transactions. So there are only two levels there. So yeah, <clears throat> and it's possible to enable a detailed one, but it also introduces some overheads on the ground for people to do that. So with that, we have to carefully decide and apply apply that there. System-wise, it's fairly easy to implement. So we have very good uh, uh, JGM IMIS that uh, uh, is being used, and this MGram, uh, this uh, uh, ONM platform that uh, we may call Naljal platform, uh, will be an extension of what is already existing in the database. So yes, uh, we will be doing that, and uh, in fact, this slide basically talks about that only. So this is the first, uh, 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 in fact, uh, presentation that we are having, and we will have it more intense discussion with the state. And you will find ways and means uh, so that people use it because it makes sense. Just to add to it, uh, in our Karnataka state also, we have a website, Kanles uh, Panchamitra, wherein not only uh, this app. Uh, this uh, water tariff collection, the collection of all other taxes of panchayats are also included in it, and uh, other activities of all gram panchayat, th their members' history, their meetings, proceedings, everything is uploaded. And I request all of you also to go through that website. This uh, they are open. It is called Panchamitra for RDPR Karnataka. Actually, we are running out of time. So if we can continue the discussion during lunch or during coffee break, then it would be really appreciated. Thank you so much, Mr. Krishna Kumar. It is now time for the last case study presentation uh, before we depart for lunch. I would like to invite Professor Gopal Nayak to present the case study on working off single bullet scheme and multi bullet scheme Case studies from Orissa and Karnataka. A big round of applause for Professor Nayak. Thank you so much.
Okay, uh, I am told to take care of all the you know overruns so far and so on. So let me try to do it as much as possible. Uh, so this is a, a you know a case study of five gram panchayat of uh, five uh, schemes in Orissa uh, single village schemes. Uh, we have basically looked at uh, the sustainability from the viewpoint of uh, source, financial, uh, institutional, um, and operations. We would like to thank the Gram Vikas who has who have been very kind enough for to, to, to support this, essentially allowing us to do the study as well as sharing all the data that are required for this case study. So uh, key components that we have considered are the water source, uh, operations, finance, and institutional, uh, as I uh, said before. And in source sustainability, we are looking at is the water source perennial, uh, source reliability and water quality, uh, potential for development of uh, additional sources, uh, reuse of gray water, uh, possibility of source contamination in future, and are there actions needed to ensure sustainability. In operations, we are looking at the household coverage, uh, current water quality issues, frequency of water quality tests, utilization of water quality test uh, reports, uh, regularity of water supply, water meter reading, turnaround time for fixing the repair and maintenance. In financial, we are looking at the determination of water charges, billing cycle, amount charged, water charges collection, full cost of delivery of water, water per kiloliter. Of course, you know, we, we, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the full, you know, full cost uh, calculation a little later, uh, as well as operational cost of delivery of uh, water, uh, monthly cost of delivery of water per kiloliter. Uh, and generation of you know, whether they are generating surplus or deficit over the full cost as well as the operational cost. Uh, bank accounts, whether it's created as well as whether, whether there are corpus fund generation. Institutional, we are looking at you know, the extent of contribution made by the household, formation of VWAC, extent of involvement of the community, ability to resolve issues, periodicity of you know, salary payment to the in-charge person, which affects, of course, the water service delivery, and grievance redressal mechanism, and also time taken to resolve the grievances. So these are the components on which, or the parameter on which we are assessing the sustainability issues. So the uh, place of uh, our work is in Ganjam district of Orissa. Uh, there we have chosen four blocks, uh, Surada, Kalikote, uh, Chatrapura, and Kukudakandi, and in those we have selected, uh, you know, schemes. Uh, all of them are single village schemes, and two in Chatrapur and one each in these other uh, blocks. Here is the profile of the habitations, so we can look at uh, in terms of population. Of course, you know, some of these are very small, like uh, Mitrapur, Jyotinagar, and Kajurishai are uh, small villages. Whereas, you know, Kamapali sort of represents most of the villages that we would have in India. And of course, this is a little bigger village, uh, Kumara Begapali. Uh, in terms of profiles, you know, uh, three of them are dominated by, of course, most of them. The, the households are belonging to the uh, tribal uh, community. Uh, whereas Kamapali has both general as well as uh, scheduled caste and in the Kumara Begapalli, again, general and scheduled caste. If you look at the BPL card holders, in some cases, let's say Mitrapur, Kajuri Shai, and Kamapalli, there are high number of households having uh, the BPL card, uh, whereas in Juthi Nagar and, uh, and in Kumara Begapalli, uh, it's, it's a, you know, a, a, a smaller number. Of course, we don't know whether it's because of the inefficiency or whether it is, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, the numbers, uh, the, the households are a little better in terms of economic conditions. So water source in all these uh, uh, villages, a dug well, tube well, uh, and spring, in some cases, you know, especially in Mitrapur, it is a spring. Power source used, 
again you know it, there are solar power used in three of them uh, of course even in kamapalli there are there is a solar power used uh, along with the electricity so both solar and electricity uh, is used uh, whereas uh, kumar vega pleads you know the the um, the source of the power source is basically electricity uh, power used for distribution so all of them are gravitational uh, uh, four of them are gravitational methods because the tank is at oht is at a higher level and in the kumara begapalli it's basically pump driven because of the ground level storage uh, tap connections uh, as per the gram vikas design three tap connections in all the four uh, uh, schemes whereas in the kumara begapalli which is actually having a vasudha scheme of uh, the orissa state and therefore there is slightly different and uh, you can see one tap connection at the door step of the house uh, water meter in installation we see uh, in water meter installed in all the four first four uh, uh, schemes uh, whereas in case of in the vasudha scheme the you know meter is not there om in charge vwscs in all the cases uh in fact in the last case the kumara bega police uh, women sag which is actually taking care of the moon uh, operations and uh, water charges the the uh, you know basis of charging the water is flat rate in the first three cases uh, whereas in the fourth case which is actually meter based unit charge you know this is very rare that we find in uh, uh, you know in most of the schemes where you know the water charge is based on the meter reading and the last one is a flat rate uh, project compl- completion these are more recent projects so of course you know so the improvements still have to be done uh, kajuri shai is actually uh, completed in 2019 but the others are in uh, 2021 these are some of the pictures of the uh, place in terms of water source that were there earlier um you know streams and of course the pond the well and so on and the newer uh, infrastructure developed you know in terms of this pump house uh, well water dug well and uh, you know covered with this uh, concrete and the storage tank and uh, pump house and so on so if you look at the uh, sustainability you know source sustainability uh whether uh, water source is perennial if you put together the different water sources like the dug well tube well and the uh, spring and so on they are you know uh, you can make it perennial though in many cases we uh, uh, see that during summer time there is always uh, an issue of uh, uh, sufficient water but you know if you're looking at the multiple um, uh, sources that are available one can say that it is uh, you know the water source is perennial so source reliability uh, so therefore you know having uh, a reasonably good source of water in these places uh, reliable uh, you know the reliability of the source is high uh, development of additional sources possible because of the you know dug wells and additional uh, structure can be created uh, reuse of uh, grey water so All, almost all of them have backward uh, sorry uh, backyard garden uh, especially the vegetable garden and therefore there is a, a good use of the grey water uh, the possible source of contamination one of the things that we have observed is there is contamination you know pathogenic contamination there uh, though it at, may be at a very low level and we don't see very serious uh, impact on the health of course you know uh, but uh, the pathogenic contamination is there and that is uh, a potential uh, you know uh, hazard uh, with the uh, uh, drinking water there are there action needs to be uh, taken care in order to ensure sustainability well of course you know in like in every other cases one has to look at the water source more holistically and see how much water is available how much precipitation is there how much of ground water availability is there how what are the different sources of uh, usage uh, or what are the different usage and how can we allocate these uh, water to different uh, usage and that's something exercise that needs little broader 
uh, you know, involvement of different uh, departments and, of course, it may different stakeholders. So if you come to operations, uh, you know, in terms of number of uh, households, we can see these three are uh, smaller uh, schemes, 32 households and you know, 35 households and 46 households, whereas a has 103 households and Kumara has 355 households. Uh, water quality, as I mentioned, most of them have pathogenic contamination as of now, though at a lower level. Uh, frequency of water quality test, uh, mostly pre and post monsoon. So, you know, that's uh, another issue in the sense that, you know, pathogenic contamination, if it is there, one has to do more frequent uh, uh, water testing. In Vasudha scheme, there is a, a provision to test water for every month. So uh, that is, that, that's uh, something you know, different uh, than uh, uh, these other schemes. Uh, utilization of water quality reports as and when they find that there is problem, they try to uh, address that. Uh, and uh, mm, of course, you know, if, if there is a serious contamination issues, villages are informed by the, uh, uh, by the uh, government department in case of Kumara Begapal. So regularity of water supply, four hours in the morning and evening. Then there is 24 hour supply in these two places, Kajurishai as well as uh, Kamapalli. So that's also an interesting case, you know, which we don't see very much in many places. Uh, water meter reading, as I, as I mentioned, uh, readings are not recorded. Though meters are there, the readings are not recorded. In these cases, only uh, in Kamapalli we see that the water charge is based on the meter reading. So that's also you know, makes it interesting. So turnaround times, there is, so far there is not much of a, a repair. Uh, this has, has come up because of the recent completion of the uh, schemes and therefore, you know, uh, we do not have uh, enough data on that. So these are uh, the uh, taps uh, at the household level. Uh, this is the water quality testing where they have the H2S bottle, which is used for quality test. And if you, there is uh, already some chemical inside and if you uh, keep water, uh, you know, sample water in the bottle, the change in color actually indicates the uh, extent of pathogenic uh, uh, contamination. Then coming to financial sustainability, so who determines the water charges? In most cases, it is determined by the VWAC community, Gram, Gram Vikas, so all of them together, uh, uh, you know, decide the uh, water charges. Uh, the billing cycle is monthly in all the cases. Amount charged uh, is varies, you know, 30 rupees per month in case of Matrapur, 20 rupees in Jyoti Nagar, you know, 30 rupees in Kajuri Shahi. Here there is, of course, based on the meter, Again, you know, there is, you know, 5.5 uh, rupees per kiloliter. If uh, the uh, water consumption is more than 5 kiloliters, and otherwise, you know, it's uh, 50 rupees uh, flat rate for less than 5 kiloliter usage, which also uh, makes it a little uh, difficult because if one has used 6 kiloliters, then they pay less money than 50 rupees. So therefore, that, uh, that, that, that formula of uh, mm, uh, water charges is not really uh, uh, proper. Uh, and that also has led to some questions by uh, households and therefore they are also thinking about how to revise it. So uh, water charge collections, this has been 100% bill connection, bill collection in all the cases. Even here, Kumara Begapalli, there is most of the households are paying and if they don't pay next month, they, they, they pay. So, water uh, charge collection has not been a problem at all. Now, the, in terms of, uh, you know, cost recovery, we have looked at, you know, what is the total investment cost, and therefore, what is the actual full cost per kiloliter of water, taking into account the opportunity cost of the investment, whether it is made by the government or made by some, you know, uh, uh, donor agencies or anybody, it doesn't matter, but we are basically looking at what is the full cost of delivery. So this comes to us about 16 rupees 
per kiloliter, you know, 15, 16 rupees around that, 12 kilo, 12 rupees a little lower, and of course it can go up to 20 rupees in these, in, in, you know, in these uh, kinds of cases. Operation cost, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let me just make it uh, quicker. Uh, uh, so the operational costs are lower because of uh, the community involvement itself. In fact, here the Shramadan is used to take care of uh, the uh, water delivery and therefore the operational costs are lower. And if you look at the monthly cost of delivery of water per household, the total cost is 140 rupees, 160, 67, 177, 127, and 186 and so on. So therefore, you know, the total cost is actually much more than what you actually collect. While, you know, they may not really go for charging the full cost of, uh, of uh, 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 you know, uh, water charge, but I think it's important for everyone to know that there is much larger cost involved in delivering water to the households so that over a period of time they may be able to realize and, and when they are actually maintaining it, uh, they, they can actually, you know, think of uh, increasing the uh, water charges over a period of time. Even though 140 rupees is probably not such a big amount, you know, considering all other costs that one uh, actually spends in a, in, in a household budget. Okay. So if you look at whether they are generating surplus or not, uh, you know, there is a deficit over the total cost, but surplus over the operational cost. In all cases, we see that. Uh, bank accounts, they have done it because of the way of Gramukas and Corpus Fund. Uh, also, they have been actually uh, creating Corpus Fund. So institutional sustainability, I'll just highlight one or two points because I think we are running out of time. The, they have uh, um, paid the contribution uh, in all the cases. Uh, VWSC formation has been done. Uh, there is a 100% involvement of the community because that is how the Gramvikas actually uh, started this, uh, these projects because they said unless all the households are uh, interested in it, they come together, uh, we will not get into infrastructure development. So that has sort of helped them in terms of uh, you know, involving the whole community and that also helped in many other ways, uh, like the, the, the uh, monthly water charge collection, resolving issues, uh, and, and, and also make the system more efficient, Shramadan and so on, you know, a lot more greater participation, and probably more cost effective. I think these are some of the things that we have found. Uh, and so therefore, what are the key findings? Uh, no threats identified as far as source is concerned. The current water source can cater to the future demand. Uh, so other than, uh, you know, so other unused sources like the well and hand pumps can be kept operational conditions. In some cases we have seen they are uh, sort of abandoned and it's always good to keep that operational. Uh, creation of new water harvesting structure to augment the groundwater. Ensure any private extraction. Now one has to look at that, you know, man, how do you manage all the water sources resources in a comprehensive manner, and therefore, you know, if there are private extraction through tube well and so on, one has to be able to limit those, uh, those kinds of, uh, you know, uh, efforts. Uh, protecting existing source of source from contamination, because the pathogenic contamination has been there, and uh, implementing chlorination technology and so on. I think these are some points uh, as a key findings in, in the operational uh, and, and, and financial analysis. Uh, water charges are decided in ad hoc manner as we have been talking about. I think one can look at these operational costs, full cost, fixed cost and full cost and therefore, you know, make everybody aware of it. Even if they are not really, you know, asking for the full cost, it would be good to have an idea about uh, the full cost uh, of delivering water. Shramadan has helped operational costs also reduced by solar pumps, uh, though in a full cost, this, uh, you know, the cost of investment will be included and uh, of course that's uh, another, uh, while the government may pay in the initial uh, uh, part, but later on one has to think about how to really build 
corpus fund or so, so that you know it can be replaced when it is, comes for replacement. So funds are created from the surplus fund, and uh, there are some indication of the meter-based water charges seem to lead to judicious use of water because after meter reading has been, uh, 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 you know, um, introduced, uh, one can see a sort of a downward trend in the uh, in the consumption of water. So. Uh, the institutional uh, point of view, behavioral change methodology, the, the Gramukas has used, has uh, sort of uh, been very effective in terms of not only, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, creating the ownership, but also infrastructure development as well as O&M. Uh, and that also has led to recovery of, uh, uh, you know, water charges. So what are replicable uh, factors? One is community consensus on the project is important at the initial stage itself. Uh, it, uh, like everybody else also has said, this will facilitate contribution from the community, suitable infrastructure development, and knowledge about the system and readiness in taking over the operation and maintenance. There is a need for continuous support. This also everybody has talked about even after the communities take charge of operation and maintenance because there is a few, you know, a, a, a number of things, uh, skills that are required in whether it's a water quality testing, capability building in terms of technology management or financial management and so on. So there is a continuous support needed either through a government agency or uh, NGOs and so on, you know, in order to provide those, uh, you know, um, required uh, uh, ecosystem or the support to the individual, uh, you know, VWSC. So timely grievance redressal sort of helps in better participation of the community uh, in the management of the system. And SSGs can help in managing operations and management and in the sense that they are a little bit more uh, 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 capable in terms of uh, uh, managing the organizations because that itself is lacking in most villages, and therefore, you know, this, this, you know, that the involvement of SSGs would help. So, what are the challenges? Water quality testing and maintenance is a challenge because it includes, you know, maintaining lab or kits and and, and also uh, uh, knowledge about how to test it and how to record it and how to read it and so on. So, those are issues. The second one is the use of meter. Uh, uh, readings in actually making, you know, in, 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 in uh, coming up with the water charges. And now, you know, it has several advantages. Actually, you know, the community should be more forthcoming to use the meter reading to charge water because that will be more judicious, more fair to everybody because, you know, depending on the number of people and so on, the water charges could also vary and so on. And therefore, it would be a fairer system. I think it, the, the, the advantages should actually be uh, in, internalized by the community in order to make it more acceptable. And source sustainability is definitely is another issue which also requires that several departments should come together in order to manage the water resources and also agreeing to share wa you know, uh, water for different uses. So those are some of the issues in, in terms of policy recommendations. Training people is one of them. And, uh, you know, maybe there is a possibility of increasing the number of days in NREGA in order to help, you know, individual households to pay for the water charges. So you increase the water charges or try to recover, you know, as much cost as possible, uh, certainly about the operational cost, moving towards the, uh, you know, full cost but facilitate through an REGA scheme and so on with more opportunities for them to work and, you know, earn money. Uh, the creating proper ecosystem is very important, whether it is through government agency or NGOs combined and so on, because there are several uh, issues with respect to technical, operational, and financial management that needs to be provided to the VWSE. Uh, assistance in providing solar pumps technology would help in reducing operational cost. Uh, training is needed for computation of costs and fixing the water charges uh, and encouraging meter-based charges. And again, there is also some 
uh, training needed with respect to uh, seeing how it can be uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, made to work. One last thing, you know, uh, maybe, you know, since, since if, if you want the VWAC to move from, let's say, just recovering the operational cost to full cost, then the government may provide some kind of an incentive in terms of, you know, matching grant or so. In fact, the government has schemes in matching grant in many other uh, places. In fact, IAMs also sort of benefited from the, you know, in the initial years when they want to be self-funding uh, agent, uh, funding institutions, they uh, got benefits from the um, uh, you know, government in terms of matching grants and so on. So that means if you generate surplus, the government will pay that much money to the uh, to create a corpus fund, so that over a period of time, you don't have to worry about replacing the assets through government funding, but you will have enough money to uh, fund yourself. I think that is something we did some calculations based on the case studies, and we found that you know the uh, the extent of uh, funding needed will be about 7,500 crores per year. So that's something to, to think about and then we can discuss in detail later on as well as, you know, of course, uh, there has to be uh, uh, some convincing arguments to, to take it up and so on, yeah. So uh, the other uh, one is actually the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, multi-village scheme. Uh, I don't have I think I'll just uh, try to wind up very quickly. Uh, maybe I'll just highlight on uh, just the, you know, the financial aspects of it, okay? Multi-village scheme, anyway, the MVS part of this scheme, this is in uh, Uttara Kannada district of uh, Karnataka uh, and the Gokarn uh, village, multi-village scheme is in this area. Uh, these are the GPs involved and the villages in each one of the GPs. Uh, there are 19 villages and six gram panchayats involved in this. And this is the area. The, uh, uh, why I am saying, I'm sort of, uh, you know, interested in looking at this is, of course, this area is, you know, heavy rainfall area. So therefore, water resources should be abundantly available. But there, are, there is a problem because the, you know, seawater comes into this area. And therefore, you know, there is, of course, even the salt is being produced in this area. Therefore, the salinity is very high in this area, especially during summer. It's very high salinity. And therefore, providing fresh water is a, is a, is a really uh, very, very helpful for the uh, people in this uh, area. Not in all places, but in some places. So, so uh, you know, that's where uh, it's interesting, you know, how uh, actually they are trying to they, they are getting this water from uh, Gangavati River, uh, which is about 17 kilometers from the uh, these villages, um, and then of course you know it is treated and purified and then supplied it to the uh, villages. Um, and uh, let me just you know if you look at water quality, even the raw water is reasonably good except for turbidity. The rest of the parameters are just good even after it, it's as good as you know treated water itself. But the, there is a proper treatment facility is there as well as there is a testing on an everyday basis. And therefore, you know, you don't see much of a problem with the treated water. Of course, if there is a problem, it will get corrected in the, you know, uh, the treatment plant itself. So earlier, the uh, major um, source of water was the, basically the, the, the bore well and the motorized water supply, which is basically small tanks with a tap. People can go and collect water from there and so on. But now the, uh, the, uh, uh, with, the, with the Jaljeevan mission, uh, there has been a, uh, the uh, connect, you know, tap water connection to the households. These numbers essentially indicate the percentage of households being covered uh, by the uh, scheme. Of course, the scheme started as a non-JGM, but now being converted into a JGM scheme. Uh, so, of course, they, they also looked at what is the future requirement, and, and uh, the, the uh, scheme is 
uh, scheme's capacity to meet those future requirements as well. Uh, operation maintenance, of course, there is, there is, you know, in terms of, MV, look at MVS, there is a quite a bit of operation maintenance expenses are there on various, uh, you know, uh, um, expense items like the establishment charges, electricity charges, and so on. Uh, so this is about uh, 1 crore 30 lakhs uh, of rupees uh, as an operation expenditure for the whole year. And then if you look at the water consumption, so you see this kind of a uh, pattern. So which is essentially saying that from uh, once the monsoon gets over, the water demand starts increasing. And during summer months, it's, it's going to be very high. So that is a very uh, peculiar kind of water demand in such uh, places where there is a high rainfall, fresh water is available during monsoon season. A little bit more, you know, it may be extended till December, January, but after that, you know, you need really fresh water. Of course, you know, if one, if one can look at you know, how wa rainwater harvesting can actually help in really taking care of that, uh, but you know, certainly the you know, fresh water availability is an, uh, is an important uh, uh, requirement there. And uh, the similar pattern you see in different uh, gram panchayats. Uh, in financial, uh, uh, you know, analysis, uh, when we looked at the you know, total cost uh, per kiloliter, it comes to about 26 rupees. So in earlier case studies, we have seen around six, 15, 16 rupees or 20 rupees, but here it is 26 rupees and about 6 rupees 85 paisa is the operational expenditure per kiloliter in the MUS part of the system. And of course, there is also an additional uh, operational expenditure at the IVDS part of the system. So uh, if you look at the annual operational uh, expenditure per household, it's about 1,438. Uh, and for monthly expenditure will be about 119 rupees as far as only operational expenditure is concerned. And total expenditure will be 100 and, uh, 456 rupees per month per household, which is you know, as, uh, quite high. That is because of the, you know, the infrastructure development at the MUS stage itself. So that's uh, quite a bit of expense, you know, expenditure goes into building those infrastructure. So if you, so they are charging 80 rupees, 100 rupees and so on, on an average 90 rupees, and that's actually not uh, covering the operational cost of the uh, scheme. So, you know, in, in these cases, you know, unless you charge at least about 190 to 120 rupees is not going to cover the operational uh, cost. So one has to think about how to make up that deficit. Of course, the government uh, grants is one uh, way to do it. Um, are there other ways of uh, overcoming this uh, you know, deficit in the operational cost? I think that's something uh, one has to really th uh, think about. Uh, I'll just skip this. I'll come to... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, this is, uh, 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 yeah, uh, these are the charges and these are the full costs uh, in different, uh, uh, you know, villages within the scheme. You see slight variation in the operational cost uh, and these are the operational cost at the IVDS, so that is, you know, in-village development distribution system. So about 25 rupees uh, per household as the operational cost. So, um, Anyway, I'll just skip these, and then if you look at, uh, therefore, so sustainability, MES part of it is, is actually perennial Rio river, and this particular scheme, there would not be much of a problem in terms of so sustainability because there is also naval base there, and people will make sure that, you know, the, uh, the water is available. I think there, there is a vented barrage is being... Uh, constructed there and therefore it will not be a problem and therefore the VDS will also not will not have problems. Uh, water meter readings are recorded uh, uh, but it's not used for uh, charging uh, uh, households. Uh, that's probably in the, uh, in the in the in the next step or so you know uh, this can be done. Uh, financial as far as uh, the current charges are concerned there is a deficit over the operational cost as well as, of course, total cost. Uh, and, uh, of course, you know, institutional part as far as MUS is concerned, government takes over it. 
and I, yeah, IVDS. Uh, you know, there is, uh, there is uh, VWSC being formed, and it has been a little slow process in terms of really uh, making them to take uh, over the operational and uh, maintenance of the system. So what are the takeaways? So we need to study the treated water dependence pattern because in some cases, especially in these cases, during the summer months, there's a uh, you know, um, high dependence on the treated water, whereas in the other cases, it is not. Uh, whereas other months, it is not, uh, especially of monsoon months and so on. So therefore, it is important to look at the, uh, what is the pattern of uh, dependence and can we come up with an appropriate system for uh, this, uh, such, a, such a pattern of uh, uh, consumption. And uh, op computation of the total and operational cost of delivery of water, making people aware of the cost of uh, you know, delivery of water, and of course, creation of water uh, quality and, and, and testing responsibility. One good thing about uh, this particular MVS is there is a water testing done at the MVS level as well as at the village level, household level testing is done by the health department. I think. So that's, uh, so therefore there is a quite a bit of water testing done and in water quality testing done and if there is any problem, they are able to address it. So therefore, uh, that's a reasonably good system in terms of uh, water quality testing. Challenges addressing heterogeneous concerns of the habitations. A cost recovery is a, in a major issue. And of course, involvement of community and efficiency of operation and maintenance. These are uh, the concern as far as the you know IVDS is concerned. So let me uh, stop at this. I think I ran over. I didn't see him, so therefore I was able to take a little bit more time. Thank you so much, Professor Naik. I'm sure you all have questions, but we will be taking those during the breakout sessions. If it's possible, uh, anyone can, uh, does anyone have a small question? We can have one or two. So, uh, Professor, I just wanted to know whether uh, 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 cost involved in replacement of plant machinery or pipes is uh, considered during uh, working out of the uh, total cost. Yes. It was considered. So in, in the operational it was considered yeah. in the operational. Yeah. Yeah. So the time period taken for the for, uh, 25 cost years. Twenty-five, 25 years. years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that and is uh, something I think we need to probably cross-check with you guys because we had seen twenty-five th years in some cases. Th thirty, 30 years, years. Thirty, 30 years. years in some we are cases. doing it on a thirty years. Yeah. But in okay. fact, uh, we can even. Uh, I know, split those different components and yeah. some may be 30 years, some mm -hmm. may be 25 years and so on. Of course, we went by the uh, DPR, uh, but uh, you know, one can also fine tune that to see what is the exact cost of uh, delivery of water. Yeah. And uh, uh, at arriving at the total user charges, uh, no, uh, cost in the non-revenue water was considered, sir? No, 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 we have not considered that because the, we need to estimate the uh, you know the, uh, the, the the total amount of non-revenue water. If all the meters are there in place, then it is easy to estimate that, and then come up with uh, uh, non-revenue water. Uh, right now, you know, if you look at the non-revenue water, essentially the Anganwadi schools and panchayats. Mm -hmm. Uh, some, some private of the schools places primary. that we, yeah, yeah. Uh, added in students. Yeah, of course, it? if there is a breakage of pipes uh, and so on, yeah. but I think that we are mm -hmm. not expecting, you know, this is just, uh, um, I think, completed in 2021, okay. and therefore okay. we don't expect that. But I think that's an important thing. Can we have these measurements mm -hmm. at different levels to in order to find out what is the extent of non-revenue water? And therefore, of course, it helps in different ways. Yes, one is calculation of the cost. Second yeah. one is to monitoring yeah. the uh, non drinking water itself. You know, in some cases in MP, we have seen people have taken out the uh, the yeah. tap itself, yeah. and then the water just they flows. Use it for the agriculture. And the yes. think about the extent of non the water yeah. that will be there in those kinds of systems. I think these are some things. I think we are going forward. We should really try to see and especially you know meters in various places so that you know you understand how much of water is flowing to which part of the habitation and and how much is used in the meter 
even if they are, we are not uh, charging according to meter, uh, meter uh, but at least taking the reading itself will be very good. Thank you, sir. So it would be... Uh, uh, regarding that user charges from government funding, 15 finance would be uh, the solution. Yeah, Thank yeah. Thank you. That was my suggestion. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, at SVS level. MVS level, anyhow, we'll have to bear. Yeah. Government see, I think, you see, the question is, the first thing to, to be conscious about the total cost in the world. Number two is, how are you going to fund the, the expenses that are going to come in the future? See, government, for government to spend, you know, in bulk amount, of course, there is a scheme going on, and therefore, uh, the separate budget is allocated and so on. But in the uh, years to come, uh, you know, if there is a sudden jump in the no, I want cost, to, I want to intervene here, sir. Yeah. We, we as the government of Karnataka, we have made provision for OINDM of MVS projects yeah. up to the SBS level. Yeah. SBS level, GP has to do. From this year, we have made provision of 300 crores for all the MVSs which are yeah. running, yeah. which are going to be increasing the next yeah. year as yeah. and when they become operational. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Only thing is, you know, what I want to say is, you know, it's always better if we make communities more responsible so that it, they are more efficient run, running the operation and maintenance, and therefore the operation maintenance cost comes down, number one. Number two is uh, whether, you know, one can look at financing. Let's say government can provide certain amount of subsidies and so on for some, let's say, hilly regions because their cost is very high or these are uh, biodiversity hotspots and therefore you know they can't do many things and therefore yes. you want to give subsidy on certain things yes you can or SCSTs you know or uh, dominated villages so a certain amount of subsidies can be provided through the state grant so that is just fine but we need to be conscious about the total cost in the world and make the community aware of those costs I think that's probably is, uh, more important Uh, any one small quick question, is it? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we are running really short of time. You can save the questions for the breakout room discussion, which is after lunch. Thank you so much, Professor Nike. A big round of applause for Professor Nike. Thank you. Uh, I have some important announcement regarding the next few sessions. So, uh, it is time for a well-deserved break. We should be serving lunch at MDC Lawn. Our coordinators will guide you to the lunch menu and we will be resuming the program at 2 p.m. That is what we want to resume, but I, let's see, like we want to resume it at 2 p.m. After the lunch, we would be having the group discussions, okay? And uh, the group discussions will be focused on four topics, water source and quality, operational sustainability, financial sustainability, and institutional sustainability. I would request the coordinators of the four groups to be here. Please welcome Mr. Sundar, who will be coordinating quality, water quality and source, and uh, Ms. Madhavi. Mr. Sundar? Yeah. So you should know your coordinators so that they can guide you to your respective rooms. Uh, then we have Mr. Pawan, who will be coordinating the financial sustainability. And Mr. Avik, who will be coordinating the institutional sustainability. And after lunch, please assemble in front of the registration desk from where uh, we will guide you to your respective rooms. Okay? And... Uh, you should have received an email regarding your assignments to the respective groups. In case you have not received or you are not aware in which group you fall, please uh, contact Mr. Pavan or there is a list downstairs as well. You can find your respective names there. Uh, after the lunch and after the breakout discussion, we'll have a short coffee break, after which we'll be back here at 3.15 p.m. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you can leave your belongings here. You don't need to carry it all the way. So please come for lunch. Thank you so much.
Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please? We will be soon starting the panel discussion and I request all of you to be seated for the same. Thank you. Hello. Check one two three three two one check. Hello. Check one two three three two one check. Hello. Check. You can take this because you you can use this. Do I need it? On it. Hello, check, check. Hello everyone. I hope I am at audible. The distinction of coming here without being introduced and then introducing other people. Uh, I am Anoj and uh, we'll be now joined by four esteemed panel members. So it's, a, it's just a matter of an epiphany. Otherwise the entire day I was feeling like saying, oh, this is going to be an onerous task, right? There are going to be four heavyweights of the field and what am I going to ask them? What I realized by being a bumblebee into all the four groups that well, the discussions are pretty much deep on their way of finding something. I don't really need to ask much. And so I feel my job has been made easier. And with that, without going into any further details of what else I saw as a bumblebee, I would like to invite Pawan to be a panelist. Pawan, please come. <clears throat> Apoor, I can't see you. Yeah, please. Uh, Hello guys, for every panel we have to do it. Uh, Sundar, please. And Devyang, come. Please, please take your seat. So with that, we have a panel. Uh, as you may have already realized, because I believe everyone was part of some group, and so the four moderators of those four groups are here as the panelists, right? And uh, before I go into asking the questions, I just want to say this has been a fantastic day, full of illuminating ideas, uh, questions that were really throwing you off the guard and trying to make one find a completely new perspective. So I'm really thankful to the organizing team, uh, including Argyam team as well. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Professor, for actually holding the chair very well uh, on this particular subject and to the Government of India team that provided perspective in the two different Bumblebee forms that I could hear, and we'll find all of that here. So let me start by first single question. What we are going to do, gentlemen, is I'll ask you one question. And by the way, before somebody writes it on X or any other, this is very unfair. This is all male group, right? I mean, so we realize saying what is wrong with the water sector at the moment. And with that, gentlemen, <laughs> uh, the first question I'm going to ask all of you is, what are the key challenges each of your group discovered in that discussion? right? And we are going to keep to that remit, because then there's going to be uh, second question, and there's going to be third question. And Divyang has got a flight, right? So we need to finish in time. So Divyang, why don't you start? What was the key, uh, or what were the key challenges surfaced in your session? Okay, great, thanks. So I think our group discussed about the operational sustainability aspect in terms of the, how the 
systems are going to be, and there are four different elements we used as a kind of a hook to discuss. So one is about the VWSC, its capability. Second is about the service benchmarking in terms of the service delivery. Then we had a, something related to call infrastructure, so SVS just versus MVS, and then the last is about the technology part. Now each section has a one challenge, but I would like to just focus on one or two core challenges. I think the one uh, important challenge we found in terms of the service level benchmarking missing in many cases. In terms of the government of India has defined the guidelines, but whether that is understood by the users or what a utility services, what we call a VWSE or Gram Panchayat, whether that is really percolated down with the right understanding or not. If that's not being there, then there will be challenge in terms of a making a water utility services of Gram Panchayat as a water utility service. So that's, I think, the, one of the biggest challenge, and I'm sure that will have a direct linkages with the institutional sustainability aspect also. The second part, which I think uh, we also realized, and I think we discussed, the group discussed about the uh, pros and cons of the technology. Sometimes, uh, because of the technology uh, obsession is so high, we go with too much of technology into the system, which makes uh, system uh, not sustainable. So either we start investing too much of resources, so we talk about the IoT. The IoT has its own pros and cons. It has some way it's worked, some way it didn't work. So how you can actually balancing out in terms of use of a technology in providing the solutions to ensure sustainability rather than do over overdo on the technology space. So that's, I think, the two larger challenges we, uh, our group talked about on the operational sustainability aspect. The one small point on, I think, the SVS versus MVS is going to be very critical because both economics, what uh, Professor mentioned today, is very, very striking. Uh, and I think the one discussion point, whether the ONM cost of multi-village should also be loaded to the users or not, because that's a covering 20, 30 villages where the intra-village system in the single village is actually having a very low ONM cost. How you can differentiate between the MVS versus SVS and you are overburdening the uh, consumers or users into the MPN system by putting up a more uh, OPEX cost as a water tariff. So these are, the, I think, the few challenges we discussed in our group. Thank you. If I were to paraphrase, what I'm hearing is there are three major challenges. One is, I'm taking your second one first, don't overdo the technology. The first one uh, is actually uh, paraphrased to say the roles and responsibilities across the layers. While the program has been going on for four years, whether those are really very well understood and there are variation from state to state and those need to be kept in mind. And the third one is obviously as we realize, saying in operations and maintenance, the MVS versus SVS, that choice itself is a pretty challenging choice to make. Over to you, Sundar. So, thanks, Anuj. So in our... Um, I think the first big thing that we all spoke about was that uh, after JGM, if there is no water in pipes, then there is no point of this entire mission. So that's the first and you know the longest discussion that happened in our in our room. That how do you ensure that there is water in pipes? That is source sustainability. You know? And we I think the group felt that JGM, as it has been envisaged, the guidelines, village action planning, it talks about source sustainability. Um, there is a particular section within the planning process right now which talks about uh, allocations for source sustainability. But then um, there is capacity issues at the, at the village level. Um, the pace at which the program has gone about and the emphasis of the program uh, means that um, sustaining of the source, especially groundwater or spring source, has not been the priority of the program you know, till now. But then we cannot wait longer um, because... Um, um, this is something which uh, which normally affects the sustainability of most other pipe water schemes even earlier and thereby source sustainability has to become a mission in itself. So if you have 10 lakh sources right now, we have to actually make it like a measured target thinking, okay, how many sources are sustained, you know, as of, assuming that nothing is sustained, you know, as of today. And then the group went into, you know, what could be the recommendations in terms of uh, the VWC or the Panchayat itself becoming capable, converging with other programs such as NREGS or uh, utilizing GPDP planning and funds to be able to think about activities such as recharging the water sources, which does not necessarily mean that the source will be sustained just by recharging, but then at least, you know, getting till that point of recharging, you know, your water source 
so that source sustainability uh, is at least being thought about. But in the larger picture, I think the group definitely spoke that the biggest competitor in the rural areas to drinking water sources or drinking water supply is irrigation. I mean, let us face it, let us talk about what is not there in this room. Uh, 70 to 90 percent of rural water is not used by drinking water. Even with 70 LPC, let's say for Odisha, it's still going to be irrigation and irrigation is guided by a totally different set of incentives from market prices to energy pricing and so on. We all know about it. So we are not going to, Jaljeevan Mission's mandate is not probably to address that larger water problem, but we need to be cognizant of the fact that unless that is addressed, this entire infrastructure is, is assuming that water is going to flow in pipe. So that was one big challenge that you know our group spoke about, that there is a larger problem that we need to be aware of. We need to contribute to that larger problem solution, which for which even there are other players you know, all around. The second point was about quality and the group largely accepted that there has been a big change in terms of perception of quality from different actors during Jaljeevan mission. So when there's the senior wash expert in our room who has been actually going around to different states, when people have been speaking to community over time, at least right now, there seems to be a wider general acceptance of certain issues. I mean, like maybe five years back, people, uh, community awareness about issues like, uh, let's say, arsenic was perhaps very low. But then today, if you say arsenic, people might say cancer. I mean, there might be, you know, largely uh, there is, you know, some kind of vague linkages, you know, which are there, not everywhere, but at least, you know, to a certain extent. But having said that, is there a demand in terms of trying to get to know about your data, about information. I think Jaljeevan Mission dashboard today talks about six million, seven million data points or something of that sort, right? There is a huge you know, uh, data bank which is already built up, right? But what is the means by which a community person on ground, even if there is interest, accesses this data? Even if you access this data, what does it mean to you? And even if you know what it means to you, what do you do about it, right? So there is a whole area to be addressed in terms of quality as to making it more accessible to people, uh, whichever way, you know, that you make it accessible and actionable by people. So that's a whole second set of challenges that you spoke. The one was about sustaining the source, the second sure. was about quality. So again, trying to paraphrase, thank you, Valpert uh, Sundar. The first one, he basically said, saying the sustaining of the source itself, so the 10 lakh sources, has to be a separate mission with targeted uh, pursuit there. The other piece, which so that to me uh, sounds even more interesting is to actually bring out that A, while JJM does not have much of a say on how agriculture uh, behaves, but we can't ignore, we can't afford to ignore that uh, you know, elephant in the room because that's the biggest user. And so obviously the convergence, not only at departmental level, but interministerial level convergence might be the way to go there. And the thirdly on the quality, awareness has definitely happened. Data banks seem to have happened. Uh, but how does one actually access that data and do something about quality? That still remains to be seen as a challenge. Apurva, over to you. Thank you. So our group was looking at uh, institutional issues, and we looked at two separate systems. So we looked at the multi-village system and the single village system. Let me come to the multi-village where um, uh, it's so the there is a plethora of institutional designs around uh, multi-village systems. Um, some VWSC, a contractor, third party doing it. So there's a range of system across different states. And uh, while there were some opinions in the group and come later on which is the better one, but this is a challenge as to uh, how the state looks at multi-village systems. And does the same department look at multi-village system or do they create a separate entity to look at this multi-village systems? So I think those are issues which are still slightly blurry. And some states have, of course, like Madhya Pradesh, gone ahead and developed a reasonably uh, sound system of making sure that the contractors are accountable. But we need to understand that the challenge here is that these are all largely monopolies. There are few, few limited contractors doing all these multi-village systems across the country. And therefore, there is a danger of a monopolistic system not having redressal. Okay. The, for the single village system, there are, I think, three, four issues which emerge as challenge. One is the sheer multiplicity of institutions at the ground level. So the same village will, will have VWSC, then there will, of course, be the Panchayat, then there will be the SHG, and then some other committees. And sometimes these institutions play off against each other, and therefore they don't coordinate. Uh, the Panchayat sometimes is not very happy 
with the power given to the WSC. So there are all sorts of forces, and there are good suggestions of how this can be converged together. But that, that's, that, that's on the suggestion side, but that's one challenge. The second challenge is that the principle of subsidiarity is not really being followed. So many panchayats are very large panchayats. They have two and a half, three thousand 3,000 households. They have 10, 15, 20 hamlets, and uh, some large and some small. So the tendency in all these places is that the place where the sarpanch belongs or where the majority belongs, those get served and the rest get largely excluded. So the system, the village gets tick marked as done, but you go to the village, then 30%, 40% of those on the outskirts of the village, they've not got any service. And that's, that's very common in tribal areas. So it actually, this happens in the poorest areas of India. It happens in Bihar or large states like that, or it happens in the tribal areas. So that's one major challenge. How do you design institutions around this, this, this diversity of habitations? And there is again a model, the Bihar model, but we can talk about that later. The third uh, issue is of, of uh, what we call uh, the, the multiplicity of state organizations which also compete with each other. So the Panchayat Raj Department and the PHD and how they play off against each other and whether they work together or not. And that has a major bearing on the institutional design and the ecosystem on the ground because if these people have differing policies, one gives free, the other charges, if these things are happening within a state, it's very difficult at a ground level for somebody to actually run, run uh, a system. Uh, the fourth thing is a very curious thing, that the handover is not happening because you have two very reluctant partners in the room. So the government doesn't really want to hand over because they're very nervous, they'll mess and come back to me. And the panchayat doesn't want to take over because they don't know what the hell they're getting. So you have, you have a design which says that this should happen, and you have counter incentives for <laughs> at both levels. So therefore, this handing over really is not happening or is not happening effectively. And our th uh, suggestion, let me give that suggestion because it was a very good suggestion. The suggestion is that we should not look at it as a binary, that this should not be handed over, not handed over. It should be a gra gradual process where roles are systematically handed over and therefore <coughs> there is a gradual capacity to take over, uh, an acceptance of taking over. Otherwise this binary thing is really doing more harm than good. And the last uh, challenge I was uh, coming up to is um, there is a, a sort of a capacity issue which has come in, but there is capacity in many ways. And the capacity of knowing what money is coming where and why it's coming there and not coming there, of what is, a, what is the thing I'm supposed to repair. So there is a lot of very small capacity <coughs> gaps which can be filled and larger capacity gaps which are sometimes deliberately not addressed. But, and therefore, designing of a capacity should be, uh, should be a much more elaborate process and capacity without creating an ecosystem is not adequate. So you say this should be repaired, but if there are no, eco, no, no repairers in the ecosystem, then where does the panchayat go? The sarpanch is not going to become a plumber. So unless, therefore, the ecosystem creation takes place of service providers, mere capacity building may not be effective. I'll stop here. Wow. A uh, long list of challenges there from Apurva's team, which is institutional uh, arrangement. I would not uh, go into all the six of it. I'll just pick up two. The one saying the reluctant partners in the room. I think that sums it up well. Yes, there is multiplicity of MVS, SVS design, and then multiplicity of agencies. But what, uh, Pawan, this sort of connects well with you is the last point, which is saying people are not even aware what finances are flowing from where. So how did the finance group fare, and what are the challenges? Hello. Yeah, before I come to the financial challenge, today's challenge was on the time management. Because of that, we missed <laughs> proper introduction to our panelist, uh, apologies from the team there. So he's a good friend, and if you don't know, uh, he is the CEO of Argium, he's a partner of this organization and uh, this uh, symposium. So I think we are talking about you know a child of reluctant partners. So a newborn baby has been born, JJM. So you're looking at cost of today versus cost of future. So the life cycle cost of a child is very high. So it's very important as a challenge to, and of biggest importance in, as 
in view of the group is that do we have a, a budget line item which says how much support I'm going to give for OM and what's the basis for that? Uh, it is not MBS versus SVS merit. It's about my citizens. If I have given these many million connections, cost of production, thumb rule is 12 rupees right now, or 5 rupees, or 1 rupee, and this cost I have to take in economic terms, no, no hidden costs first. And then I can say, okay, I will, because only taxes, tariffs, and transfers can fund the, any service, right? So I think the, in the collective wisdom of the group, it is that get a fix on the number. And that should be a validated number. Because that's a wrong start if you don't have that. Any strategy is going to be fueled by money. If you don't have, you know, Sujata will tell ISAs are not paid, then quality will not happen, tests won't happen. So it's, it can keep on going, right? And the second challenge, I think, which is uh, known, but of importance is that the funds are available. And, uh, but multiple agencies are involved in that uh, usage of that fund. So specific examples could be, there has to be a central pool is giving you money it has to be matched by state money, but it, then it has to be used for third purpose. So if anything is missed, then technically that money cannot be used or can be used. I mean, like, the problem is the funds are there, but you don't know. And many times you can use it for a specific purpose, but people don't know. So I think the laundry list is long, but we'll stop at the very specific and very big macro challenges overall of importance, I mean like, and they are not unexpected when JGM is only like one year old in terms of completed asset life, not from 2019. Yeah. Thank you. Well put, Pawn. I think uh, to me the takeaway in this articulation is uh, get the fix on the number because I guess there are so many numbers that are floating around, right? I mean every state does a different calculation and then we know, and there are per household assumptions and there are per village assumptions. All kinds of averages are there, but we really don't have fix on the total number. And this is going to be not one time, what we have already spent over the last five years. This is going to be runtime thing, like Manu was saying in the morning. So great. Thank you, panelists, for the first round, right? The second round. The question is, what are the green shoots you are seeing? We can go in the reverse order. Yeah, I think so. Uh, just to be clear from one hour, uh, 55 minutes we were discussing challenges and five minutes for the green shoots. <laughs> but that doesn't take away from the green shoots. No, no, that happens uh, only when you know the question in advance. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so I think the green shoots have to be looked in a perspective that, you know, we have to first see the scale of JGM and the green shoots for any other country could be a very big success in its whole absolute number. So. So the green shoots are strong. I think the good news is that the green shoots are strong and we should be very positive about it. And uh, there are situations in Karnataka which has done 100% metering of all the you know, connections. They have made a budget line item of whether that number is X or Y, they, it can be always improved upon. So I think there has been an exercise which has been done, which many states have not yet completed overall. And second is that the use of technology itself is not the end, we know that, but we have seen in Mgram Seva, right? It's a very powerful example actually that the, the, if you build that trust with the person that I'm paying the bill to the right agency and there's an easier way of paying and not, you know, without not paying, I think that it's a very powerful example. Of course, Pankaj was asking whether we can put grievances on it, whether we can put, but the grievances you can put if you have a solution for it. You put grievances, then even this won't happen. So you have to have a complete strategy. If you put complete strategy on place, like uh, Karnataka has a full service, right? Uh, it was being told, right? They can take care of more. I think that, that itself is, uh, you know, from a macro level, I'll stop there. There are a few others, but we can go around if you have more time after that, yeah. Sure, thank you. Apu, over to you. Thanks. No, I think there were quite a few, and the case studies actually provided some very good ideas. So, a lot of the case studies provide ideas of green shoots in a way. So, let me take from one of them is this whole idea of a ward level 
the Bihar model of taking it at the ward level and then working around a system around that. I think is a, is a, it, it makes so much sense as an idea for tribal areas, for villages with panchayats which are very large. I think it just makes sense. And it, if, if it can be done and other states can learn from it, I think it will work. I've been talking to people in Assam, for example, and because I work with an NGO there, and I spoke to this, and he says, you know, we should do it because we are going bonkers dealing with this panchayat covering seven hills, and, you know, <laughs> we don't know. So I think it makes sense. So I think that's a good idea. The second green shoot is, I think, what one of uh, uh, participants said, is this merger or a design where the best of the SHG and the panchayat and the uh, uh, WESC, they all come together in the WESC. So there's 25% reservation of SHG members in the WESC. Then there is a Sarpanch who's the head of the WESC. So if you have a design where all the key players in the village uh, uh, with different competencies come together and manage the village water system, then the chances of sustainability and reduce conflict is very high. And I think that's a good design. Maybe it's an MP design, maybe in some other states, but I thought it's a very, very good design, which we need to look at. And the third, uh, uh, about the same again is this MVS, and I mentioned it, is if you have a contract of a third party, which is really well designed, which is not only at the installation, but the BOT type of model where they have to manage everything, and uh, you, you, you hold them accountable for uh, recovery also, the, the water rate recovery. So therefore, they, if they don't deliver services, they won't get the recovery, they lose on the money. And so therefore, there's a built-in accountability mechanism. So if these kind of designs, even for multi-village systems, if they can be adopted on a scale and managed well, I think that's a green shoot that can uh, take it up. And last is that there are places, states, I was told, where all women, uh, WACs, are incentivized. So the guidelines say 50% is minimum, but if this can be incentivized overall, then you will have a large number of women, be the SHGs from panchayats, who take this up very seriously. And because they are much more to lose, therefore they'll take it far more seriously than men who end up migrating somewhere else and not really serving this. So these are, I think, some of the main issues. Wow, thank you. Over to you, Sundar. Uh, to Anuj, I mean, the group spoke about many challenges, in fact, and then there were, I mean, to be honest, you know, those are challenges, right? So one of no, the big challenges is the... But you brought up a solution in your challenge <laughs> recounting. Yeah, one of the challenges were the VWC itself, you know, because we are assuming the VWC to do so many things. So source sustainability, I mean, like how, how much, I mean, how much can the VWC do? No? And source sustainability itself is such a big question, but then... There were some interesting ideas that came up. Uh, I think Guru in our team spoke about how Karnataka, um, uh, in, uh, NREGS in Karnataka is uh, using, um, is, uh, is uh, building capacities, you know, within villages in terms of being able to access scientific information without bothering about it. I mean, without bothering about all the remote sensing, hydrology, X, Y, Z of the world, but then having it on your fingertips in terms of being able to stand at a location and say, okay, this is what you need to be doing over here. Because every point in the world, you're not going to do water recharge, right? There is a range of things that you're going to be doing, right? But then why would Narega uh, converge onto uh, prioritizing on a drinking water source? I mean, they could, they, they might, but then why would they, why would they do only that, right? And then who is that person who is going to really make, I mean, BWC is a very fuzzy kind of a, um, um, entity, right, beyond the point of time. So who is who is going to tell NREGS that, okay, you got to focus on Rosgar Sahayak, okay, focus on this. Um, so that's the gray area there. I mean, like, if, if that happens, then potentially, you know, water sources keep getting recharged or, you know, source sustained. And that could be a mission that is measurable, you know, and Karnataka, possibly the NREGS and digital tools that uh, Pradeep ji spoke about, uh, which are actually being used in a, uh, at, for different other programs. On quality, uh, there are innovations that Jaljeevan Mission is working on, which are trying to get, uh, do the next level of exercise in terms of getting information back to people. Um, also, you know, as we heard from, you know, Divyang and others, I mean, their team is doing a great work in, in Assam, where I think we are missing the fact that 
things like quality also have a lot to do with other allied departments. For example, uh, providing nutritious food in Anganwadi is a safe water problem also. Uh, midday meal is also a quality water problem because the same water is used and health workers in Assam are going around communicating about the quality of water. In five minutes a month of an ASHA worker might be much more valuable than you know um, someone else you know spending their lifetime because there is so much of trust you know in health departments and others. So there are interesting experiments put together you know all around. The request from our group in fact to this um, room and also going ahead from the JGM chair was that um, if there could be, I think the group also volunteered to work on it to help, if there could be a guideline development for source sustainability and quality to work on uh, in terms of going deeper into it as a next level you know, uh, work happening uh, so that uh, there is a convergence which happens on ground you know, with NRAGS, uh, GPDP plans and others and also quality you know, community. Features. So that's a request which the group uh, put forward here. Perfect. So we don't only have green shoots, we have actually requests to say this is the next action item. Thank you, Zunda. Over to you, Divya. Um, I think on the operational sustainability, uh, the first part is, I think the, I mean, it's a macro level, but I think there is an intent to solve that problem at the government level. That I think the good part, because they know that there is a vulnerability in the system and how that could be fixed into the system. Uh, one of the examples I would like to share that in terms of the green shoot that, how you can incentivize the water committees to perform better. If you do that in whatever way, then the operational sustainability will become a higher. Gujarat has a policy called ONM policy. So if in some parameters, including water quality, water tariff collection, supplying the benchmarking water supply, if some village water committee are meeting those standards, there is an incentive available to them. So there is maybe a short or medium term, there is an incentive which can help people to ensure that yes, this service delivery standards are important and to be met. And then the whole relationship between the service provider and users will become a stronger, there will be trust between the user and service provider. So I think that's the one um, interesting green should be, I think, found. The second, I although say the uh, don't do overdo technology, but I think technology with the new uh, revolution in the country also is a potential silver lining in terms of how you can use it if there is a community centric and more regional contextual. We can't bring every time SCADA or high tech technology but even if the IVR system can solve a basic problem of grievance redressal should be adopted. So I think the rather than shying away from the technology how you can effectively and contextualizing using the technology for Better, betterment of service delivery, that's the another area. And there are, I think, e Seva is the great model. There are in Karnataka, there are multiple. They say WhatsApp, you can put up a grievance situation. There is a system on a IVR-based system. So there are all avenues which has been put up into the system which can have an accessibility to last mile connectivity, which can include everyone who has a complaint, can put up. And there is a mechanism on feedback. So if there is a complaint, whether it has been resolved in 48 hours or uh, you know, 72 hours, that mechanism is also in place. So there, I think, few examples what has been shared by the team is, I think, uh, amazing and has a great potential to adopt in, in across the country. Perfect. So I think uh, Divyang actually changed his position on technology, and that's a great example, Divyang, right? So uh, thank you. Uh, guys, now we know in this room, saying four people who were moderating four groups, they have spoken on four different themes, we have challenges and some sense of the green shoot. Anything else, the last question to each of you, and then I'll also try and answer it for myself first. Uh, but we are going to go in this direction, starting with Pawan and Divyanglas, is to say anything else that did not get mentioned in this conversation, but otherwise it stands out to you. Something extraordinary that you saw, or something that got mentioned earlier, but which hasn't been captured by our green shoots and challenge kind of a frame. So one, one minute each uh, to all of you. But before that, I would like to mention saying, one thing that at least I heard, and I felt uh, with mixed feelings there, right? There are a lot of talk about VWSC strengthening, WIMC example. Anurakshak was uh, being given credit. I think the whole need, think there's going to be a need for a cadre. That's not yet fully underlined. And what I loved is this 
bringing in saying there is NREGS partnership, there is something possible with agriculture. So those are the two things that stood out to me. Over to you, Pawan. No, I'll, <coughs> I'll use this one minute for something which was discussed, but uh, which is, I think, a complete passion and solution for me if I look at an Asian context is that there has to be like 20x more conversation and action on quality. I mean, like if we don't have so much obsession about quality of water, we have, we heard that there are places where there's quantity not available, so first thing is quantity. But if we don't establish quality service, it's because water is actually a service, not a production. And uh, then the health nexus is not equated with that. And then we are talking about the behavior change of people getting, you know, you know, samman and other things which are very rightly put right. But if that health nexus is not truly proven, then we will fall flat. I'll stop there. I think quality is the point in the whole discussion, which needs probably one day of, you know, discussion itself. Yeah, thanks. I think two issues. One is you know, you, we talk about different states and you see a huge variability in the performance of states, you know, and, and it's inevitable in a country like India. What are, what are the incentives, what are the, how do you make sure that all the states go up a notch? It's not some states going somewhere, and other states, and then dragging the whole system behind. You know, so you, if 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 you did a grading now, there would be some states in D and some states in A. How do you make sure that there are none in D, and everybody gradually at least moves C, B upwards? And I think that requires a different approach. If you remember, one of the best mechanisms which came up was this India Today state report. You know, that changed the way state looked at their own economies. Earlier, they, you know, center data, nahi data, planning commission to blame bullshit. Now they said each state with the same money, you're performing. It changed the way state looked at themselves, their fiscal response, everything changed. Can we look at this, something like that, state's performance on water? I know there are measures, but how do you move that so that at least every state moves to a bare minimum? Otherwise, citizens in those states suffer, and that's not fair. Huh? So that, that's, that's one issue, which is, I think we need to talk about that more. Because there's a lot of money moving around and it's not having the same effect everywhere. So that is one thing. The second issue which, uh, which, which sort of, uh, you know, is voluntarism versus paid service providers. And this is, you know, we expect VWSCs and now we expect 10 women VSCs, everybody to volunteer, volunteer, you know. And is that really working or is it just an NGO or a civil society fetish that, you know, everybody, Gandhian style, should just keep on volunteering even in busy times? Or are, are there models of a balance between volunteerism for governance and paid service for accountability? Is there a golden balance which we have yet to find in the drinking water sector? Because I think we veer from 100% paid to 100% volunteer, and we are not, I don't think those are good models. So these are two thoughts. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> continuing from the point on quality by Pavan, I think something which I was sharing with Anuj, I mean, something we all recognize is that um, over the last 40, 50 years of, uh, starting from accelerated rural drinking water programs in, you know, 70s, right? I mean, there is a drought, you go deep to drill a well, right? When you, when it really matters. Uh, what really happens is that when actually water gets scarce and you don't get water, you really go and get something. And that's when quality also as a problem, you know, emerges you know, together. Uh, so the whole problem of water scarcity and quality are very closely interrelated. I mean, it's about which water, you know, are we going to drink? And these two are very closely uh, tied together. And um, when we talk about quantity of water, I think quality should come in naturally within you know, itself. So that's one point which I wanted to add to what, you know, Pavan spoke about. The second thing which came in our group, I think, uh, which also got missed is that Jaljeevan Mission has, has like a lot of transformative uh, initiatives from Jaljeevan Mission. And I would like to highlight two of them, especially in context of something which I think Bishwadeep and several others mentioned in our group, that this is an extraordinary program, you know, with a large scale and probably 
you know, this is not going to keep coming back at this scale, you know, again and again. And uh, unless we are, unless we all are constantly reminded, our skills are constantly built, capacities are increasing. It's not just about people on the ground, but everybody, all of us, practitioners, people on the ground, you know, institutions. If, I mean, issues that we work on, I mean, we are now talking about uranium, microplastics, I mean, who knows about it? I mean, you need to keep developing skills, you know, and all that. So continuous capacity building in two great initiatives from Jaljeevan Mission, the Nivas Institute in Kolkata. I mean, that is something really new, which has a huge capacity to, um, I mean, transform all the state institutions, <coughs> building, skilling, and the uh, Jaljeevan Mission Digital Academy, mm -hmm. which has, I think, an extraordinary potential of exponentially, you know, reaching out to uh, all our states and districts and villages. Um, not just limiting ourselves to, definitely, you know, in terms of, digital interactions, but capacities, building capacities, it's going to be a forever problem, you know, and a forever challenge, right? So beyond Jaljeevan Mission, that has to be something uh, which we need to think about. And already there are these initiatives where, um, as we saw today, you know, these pockets where there are islands of excellence, right? These three places, you know, where we saw Gram Vikas is Gram Vikas, right? But there are many such organizations in the country for them to be along with the Digital Academy, be along with Nivas, then the force multiplier effect is extraordinary, you know, for the country as a whole. I mean, we, when NGOs and government come together, you know, the capacity building potential is huge. So, sorry for taking more time, but yeah, let's take it. Thank you. Um, um, two points, and I think one point who you mentioned about the cadre um, of professionals. I think uh, there is a huge potential on that part. Only thing is, I think, um, how the existing social capital could be utilized for that rather than, you know, finding out uh, great skilled people and then say, these are the people who are going to solve all problems. I think that that shift need to do that. So there is a huge existing social capital which has been built not only in last five years but over a period of last decade or two. How that could be dovetailed and there are some models which are working well. That's the one, I think, uh, aspect where I think it's important. Second, I think uh, there is a also, when we look at the solutions and community participation and other, there is a difference between the prescription and options. Sometimes we started prescribing things and say ki yahi hona che, yahi karna che, rather than looking at need-based solutions. So maybe more dynamic in providing those options, solutions to the community. I think these are the two areas which I feel important. And I think the last point in terms of a we should not undermine the, uh, you know, aspiration of the community. Their aspirations have become high. They are looking at ki tap chalu kar aur shuddh pani milna chahiye. Now, rather than undermining their aspiration, how we can actually try and see that that aspiration could be met by whatever ways and means this could be done. Be, be it uh, create a cadre of professional providing the some uh, good infrastructure or use the technology. So that's the three points I thought are critical which some specs. Perfect. With that, I would like to open the session to the group, to the larger group for Q&A. Any questions in the room? For the panelists, obviously. <laughs> uh, Professor Chair, sir, it's for you all. <laughs> because not only to the panelists. See, my uh, concern is there are two major concerns as far as the drinking water supply in the rural is concerned. One is governance. Now we are telling about the sustainability each and everything. What will happen after 2024? Because the scheme is a mission mode up to 24. There is one more aspect for this. After the 73rd amendment to the constitution, and 74th amendment. In the 73rd amendment, schedule 21, water is a panchayat subject. When it becomes a panchayat subject, we, from the state government as well as from the, because it's a local government. Now it's a three-tier system, local government, state government, and the central government system. In this federal system, tomorrow a day may come with all this investment in a halfway, everything. We are forgetting this also. It is my strong this thing is that actually central government has to continue support this system beyond 24 also. Why I am telling you is this my, with my own experience. 
prior 19, 2019 when JGM was introduced, when we were doing only NRDWP funds, central government was giving us 50 percent of funds for the work and state government was giving. For the maintenance, it was only the state government and we were begging the depart FD department for the funds. That is the reason why, that is the reason why many of our old schemes did not become the sustainable. So, if you do not provide a support, financial support to the institutions who we are, which are running these schemes, by and large I will tell you all our recommendations will be on the paper only, they will be not practical, this is one. So, for that actually I have a suggestion also, tomorrow the ministry may say, even the central government may say, yes, yes, definitely it is a state budget and it is a state subject and it is a, what is a state subject? and drinking water at the rural is a panchayat subject, why we should take this into the account? What I suggest is actually, you give the fund with interest for the needy state. You give the fund with some interest. Suppose Karnataka has done 70 percent of work, requires another 30 percent. In that 15 percent of the amount that is required, you give at a certain amount of rate uh, interest like World Bank gives. So that actually money is also valid, valued and our scheme will be continuing. This is the major issue which I request Professor Chair to take into the account and also mention because 2024 is not that far away and uh, you know the political systems in the, this nation because we have to be true to our rural people also. So, I request and urge this body to take this into account. Another thing is actually in my 38 years of the rural surveys, uh, I will quote an example. <coughs> when we started with the World Bank Jal, uh, Jal Nirmal project, World Bank we started with the Jal Nirmal project, World Bank suggested us that actually 10 percent of the money has to come as a community contribution in the beginning only of the project. Project cost is say about 5 rupees KL only that time was the project cost and 10 percent of it comes. Suppose 1 crore, 10 lakhs rupees has to be paid. I will tell you none of the states have paid, none of the communities have they paid. 99 percent of the money has been paid by the contract only, I am with the closed door I am telling you. And that is why I am telling you actually such, you know, even VWC working at the free of cost of service without incentivization, 100 percent volunteers. I am a poor SC girl, lady, I have to earn my livelihood. Every day you are expecting me to come there, once in a while. If I am getting house or something like that for Gram Sabha, I can come. Is it practical? That we have. These are the two major challenges as far as the governance is concerned. Rest everything what you are telling is the system development. As far as the governance, I mean actually continuation of the scheme, these are my, uh, you know, actually you have to ponder over it actually. Okay. I hope you appreciate it, sir. Thank you so much. So with that, should we close the, uh, the Madhvi and lady moderator for the overall, should we thank everyone or are there questions in the room? Okay, yeah, Jay. Please, please bring in. You know, uh, I consider this as a policy advocacy workshop because, because the kind of agenda what we have discussed and if you look at the one policies of the several governments state governments. I have studied almost 16 to 17 ONM policies of the various state government and uh, union territories. What I found that most of the time the policy has been, de uh, the policies are developed keeping in mind the ONM aspects. And they are not largely focusing on the institutional sustainability or financial sustainability or operational sustainability. So how do we bring in those components of what we have already discussed? different sustainability component into the ecosystem and that should start with the building a robust ONM policy at the state and UT level. Even though and we are also developing this ONM policy for Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir where uh, we have uh, taken most of the examples from the Karnataka uh, state policies. So once we develop those kind of a system, built in a system into their ONM policy then there would be systematic approach at the community level, at the district and at the higher level also to adopt those policies and start practicing. We are not saying that ki we are going to achieve that 
uh, within a year, within five years, but that should be an initiative at the grassroots level, this is one. The second component which is like uh, working as a virus at the community level is lack of political will. I used to give an example in, in many of my training programs, look at how this electricity, uh, like, like the entire system has been changed since last seven years after that blackout day. Even the BPL families also started paying those electricity tariff every month, whether I visited Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, all those tribal districts also, uh, the, the poor families are ready to pay. It's the quality of service, what we are talking about and every panelist has already spoken about. So therefore, how do we bring that change into the ecosystem where the sarpanch is not going to declare that I am going to get it free. So that kind of a political will not only at the Gram Panchayat level but at the state level also. That willingness to pay by the customers, that ecosystem needs to be also built in. These are the two areas and, and the third one is the grievance redressal mechanism. I visited one of the villages in Mizoram called Silam village where I could able to see a small village of 171 households. I could able to see institutional sustainability, financial sustainability, operational sustainability that has been done by the villagers itself, the VWSCs. We have a very robust model. Even a small village, they could able to earn a revenue of almost like generated a revenue of 3.5 to 4 lakh rupees and their, their uh, monthly expenses is around like uh, 5 to 6 thousand rupees and how they could able to manage that incremental water tariff rate in collecting from the households. So the models are available, but only thing is that whether there is an willingness at the community level. So if we could look at all those things, then that is definitely going to help in bringing that sustainability into the ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I think that very clearly sums up saying this is only the beginning, right? JGM infrastructure has happened. We have started very about the O&M, right? And in the morning, uh, Pradeep ji had also mentioned that uh, here we are not to sort of share the stats and not only to share uh, some good stories or island of excellence, we are here to share what can we learn from each other and then can scale. So I think this is summing it up very well. I don't think there are any questions, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Panelist. Sharma for, uh... Thank you so much. Thank you all the panelists um, and thanks to all of you for your valuable comments and for the questions. It is now time for the workshop highlights uh, and takeaways for Jal Jeevan Mission for which I would like to invite on stage Mr. K. Murli Dharan, the Deputy Advisor of JJM. Thank you, sir. You have uh, ten. Ten, sure. <laughs> no, I'll try. I'll try to complete uh, very quickly. So today morning, when we started yesterday for this IAM program, it was a sort. Of, we keep attending this sort of many types of uh, programs, workshops. This was also one such workshop. Was uh, I thought. As usual, this CAT exam always has got some surprises. So this workshop also has a lot of surprises for me in terms of questions and others. So we had to think very hard about the various questions that have been raised. So a few points I thought I have jotted down as uh, key takeaways for us, which I'm sure would cover most of the points that have been addressed. If something is missing, please let me know. I'll include them. The first thing was it started with Professor, Professor Gopal, who said that social equity of water, he spoke about the social equity of water, so we fully concur with that, and FSTC, in fact, there is an interesting anecdote I would like to share. When we were actually planning this uh, Jal Jeevan mission, it was in 2019, November, Pradeep ji, so before your arrival. So our pr earlier uh, secretary was Mr. Parameshwar Nair, who was incidentally CEO, and he was in this World Bank now, ED. The question that came was, that how do you define an FSTC? And he said that, can we say, I mean, this is a very typical way of asking him, you know, just to probe you your thinking. So can we say if the pipeline is running around, let's say some 10 meters from your house, can you say that house is an FSTC? 
So that was the question. So it was a quite a startling thing because we never had thought that it can also be a definition for FSTC, but everybody said, no, nothing of that sort. When you have toilets for everybody, you should have taps for everybody. So that's how the taps came. And it, it was one tap, but it came into three taps, one in kitchen, one in bathroom, one in this thing. But of course, two of them have to be actually funded by states. So the point was that the social equity point I was talking. So this is fully taken in the mission guidelines, and we would still work on this for further spreading this in a larger way. And in the professor, uh, director professor spoke about integrating sustainability in the processes and he quoted a few examples from the IIM campus itself. Definitely we agree with that. A lot of ideas have come for integrating the various processes that are there in the Jimmy mission. We will do that also. We have tried it to build it in the guidelines also, but now we find that there is a lot of, a lot of scope for improving that. Uh, post our experience of last two, three years, and with a lot of intellectual discussions like this. Um, uh, it, we would be taking that also. Then the director, obviously, JJM spoke about the service delivery approach, which we have been rightly highlighting since we have almost come to 70% now. Uh, even if I assume 80, 85% of them are actually functional, we are at a very good uh, stage of uh, development. So we are now doing our benchmarks for KPIs are being drawn up. I will also come to that later on. The chief engineer spoke about timely financing. Obviously, to reach your KPIs, you need to have timely financing and strengthening of GP's role. That also we fully agree, and then we take it. Uh, Vagela interestingly spoke about integration of uh, state level, uh, at integration at the state level for behavior change communication and capacity building. When I talked to him, what actually he means by that individually, he, spoke, he told that, Many things are happening on ground, but there is no integration at the state level. So there is a need for integrating the efforts on IEC. So this is a very important point. So we would definitely take it into consideration in our next annual action plan with the states. Then he spoke one excellent thing about uh, water. That is respect for water, he said, you know, the samman for water. In fact, uh, I am forced to quote, maybe how many of you are comfortable with Sanskrit, I am not sure, but. I just can't stop quoting it for myself. There is a thing called as Ahamarshana uh, Suktam in Taitri Upanishad. It talks about what a person should pray when he's taking a bath. So only three lines I will tell you. It says, Hiranya Shringam Varunam Prabhatye Tirtam Me Dehi Yachitaha Yanmaya Bukta Mada Dunam Pabe Bhyaksha Pradigragaha this is the first three lines, only. there are some 20, 25 lines like this. It says, Ho Varun, I beg to you, I beg to you, Tirtam me dehi yachitaha, I'm begging to you, please give me water. You know why he is begging? I have done a sin with my body, with my words, with my thoughts. So please give me water, despite being a person who has done sins, in all these three accounts, and also try to wash away my these three sins with your presence. So that is the respect for water that the ancient civilization had, and I'm sure he has nicely pointed out that. Then the Bihar experience was shared with us, and he spoke about the water level uh, drinking water schemes uh, functioning, uh, use of 15th Finance Commission funds on priority. We I do agree, there are Many villages we have visited where the finance commission funds are actually not prioritized for drinking water and sanitation. It's a fact of the matter, and definitely we will work with the Ministry of Panchayati Raj because they are also an equal partner in this progress. We will try to include that at GPDP, and probably we will also reach out to you for helping us to see how best we can actually take this forward on the ground. Uh, then comes one lady, Sujata, came from West Bengal, and she spoke about uh, flat, and she told one interesting point about platform of visible pool of resources is not available on at district level. And now I am surprised at this statement, why this platform was not available. I think you are told about this point that convergence funds or pool of resources is not available at a particular level. But somehow it has not happened, it may be a reason, but the drinking water guidelines or the Jaljivan Mission guidelines have clearly told the convergence will happen only at the center level. And if you see the 28 functions of the District Water and Sanitation Commission, none of the convergent points have been missed. If at all, if them, of them have been missed, maybe that might have emerged out of the experience of the last three, four years. But definitely not so. 
it is there. Maybe it's not happening. The forum has been turned into an approving authority rather than a convergence authority. So we would work more on the convergence part of it. And because financial approvals are the first things to be given for rolling out of the infrastructure first. So that was the authority's function. So we will now work more on that. So thanks for pointing it out. The e-governance pointed out about the m -gram seva and the improvement in the collections. So I think we had to try to have a discussions with them to, tomorrow, but somehow we'll try to have it in Delhi next time. So thanks for that. Uh, that's a good learning for us. And uh, the financial analysis uh, that was carried out, no, the learnings from the financial analysis from, by the professor, Mr. Gopal Naik himself, we will definitely include that as part of our uh, assessment for our schemes. And we will use it as a key point uh, you know, sir, that key PAs for our future things. So we would be happy if you can share us the presentation so that we can take it forward at our level. Uh, somebody talked about sustainable, sustaining the sources. No funding is available. In fact, that's a very wrong conclusion because funding for source sustainability is there, not in full, but in partial. I think this was highlighted by uh, Indram also today, just, just now. We have given funds for the... It, inbuilt infrastructure for the structure, uh, recharge. But that has not happened actually on ground. So that's the reality. So, but we have been repeatedly telling this in all annual action plans and now this is coming up as a big issue. There are many states now who have achieved the 100% coverage but asking funds for improving the service levels to 55. So that is a uh, thing. So uh, it's a planning stage uh, mistake that has happened. But I think we will push it further. This is also one thing, lesson for us. And designing, um, someone spoke about the different policies on subsidy. Uh, I would like to point out here, the policies for subsidy here is, there is a strange, you know, policy, pa you know, pa parody here. You give free power to agriculture. If you go to any village, you take the ratio, at least I have done in 10 villages, I am telling you. Take the ratio of agricultural wells vis-a-vis -vis the drinking water wells. It will be no less than 1 to 1 by 20 to 1 by 30. And invariably, all the agricultural wells will be deeper than the drinking water bore wells, be at least be 50 to 60 feet. This is a reality. So here is a system where water is provided free for agriculture and you are charging a department which has got a lesser depth bore well yielding less water at a commercial rate. So this, this difference has to be worked out at the state level and perhaps this is one policy thing that we will also address along with the DOWR. We can't do it by ourselves, but this is to be taken up with the DOWR. Someone spoke about the reluctant partners. Uh, there was a good discussion about reluctant partners, but fortunately they are blessed with a child now, so it is their responsibility, they can't. <laughs> So they can't move away with those responsibility. But I can tell you uh, one very strange thing. I won't quote the name of the state, but this is also a reality. Schemes are designed in such a way, the panjayats will say, sorry sir, this is such a big scheme, I don't have money, I won't take up. Whether that particular big scheme is required for the or not, in that panchayat, nobody bothers. They will bring... 60 crore scheme to a panchayat which earns 6 lakh rupees per month. And they will say it is 15% of them is the over term cost. Now how which panchayat will do? So this is the kind of a policy issue or planning issue. I just thought I can highlight to you because this placing of schemes, right, you know, and there is an interesting shift that has happened in the Jaljeevan mission. Before the mission, we always used to say the ratio of uh, you know, water supply in rural areas dependent on groundwater and surface water is roughly between 85 to 15. Today, uh, the IMIS maintained by my good friend says it is 68 is to 32, 68 on ground, 32 on surface. There is a huge shift happening to surface water sources starting from Gujarat, followed by Telangana, followed by Kerala, then now by Tamil Nadu, then now by Maharashtra for this Maratwada grid. That is another some 25,000 crore scheme that is going to come up. So these are huge fund guzzling schemes and these were the precise worries we had when we launched the program. But how would you actually handle this uh, MVS schemes, especially when they have a common infrastructure for both urban and rural? None of these multi-village schemes, if you go to any place, will cater only to the rural areas or only cater to the urban areas. 
Many a time, invariably, it is a scheme that caters to both urban and rural, and the bifurcation of funds between the urban and rural, despite you stand up or upside down and try to say that urban ko bifurcate karo, rural mein bifurcate karo, it's very difficult to do it exactly in the estimate. Finally, they will give an estimate of 3,000 crores and say, sir, 15 percent jo hai, ye urban mein jayega, but 85 percent is So only thumb rule works there. So there is a problem of you know, actually attributing this cost or apportioning this cost to various sectors are also there and then the post-maintenance of that. I'll come to the financing. Uh, quickly, I'll finish off. I think I'm overshooting my time. Capacity building. Uh, somebody spoke about incentive to meet the service delivery. This is a one very important agenda point for the upcoming Chief Secretary's conference. We have already developed a lot of KPIs, benchmarking somebody spoke about. So we will work with uh, Professor Chair for de developing the benchmarkings for that. Then assessing the performance about the work done so far. Of course, we are doing our functionality assessment test, but that is only based for services. It's not about the quality of the works. The quality of the works are done basically through the TPIAs. So probably uh, we will take it up to at our higher level to see whether we can do a quality analysis of the work done. Some assessment of quality of work under Jalji Mission can we really do because basically it's a state subject and uh, how much we can actually go inside and poke our nose inside a state subject is also a question, but this point is taken. Then somebody spoke about, huh, you spoke about loan for Karnataka because you are closing down the scheme on 24. I again say that there is no decision on this. Please don't go with any uh, hearsays or assumptions. There is no decision taken, nobody knows. But Karnataka can still take a loan. Finance Ministry is having 1 lakh crores with a deferred uh, interest subvention for 20 years, nobody is preventing the government of Karnataka from going for a loan to meet the state share. If you have not gone for it, for JJM, that's a different thing. If you have gone for some other thing, that is also their uh, discretion. So with this, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity and it was a very lively, interactive audience and uh, we are really blessed to be here. Thanks a lot. Namaskar and Jai Thank you so much, Mr. Murli Dharan, for the comprehensive overview of the workshop. A big round of applause for Mr. Murli Dharan, please. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it, I would like to invite Mr. Viraj Tyagi, the CEO of eGovernments Foundation, to share an overview of the second workshop. A big round of applause for Mr. Tyagi. Fantastic to be here uh, on the other side of the class because I studied here and it's always great to be back here. Thank you, Professor Gopal, for the opportunity. Uh, since we are talking about poetry in the in the session before, uh, I'll just quote a 16th-century uh, poet, Rahim. I don't know how many of you he used to write Dohas. So the uh, fact that somebody showed samman, pani se samman milta hai. There's a Doha by him which says, Rahiman pani rakhiye, bin pani sab soon. So Rahiman, that's the name of the poet, ki keep water, without water, everything is, nothing exists. Rahiman pani rakhiye bin pani sab soon, pani gaye na ubre moti manas chun. So if there's no water, the man doesn't have respect. So pani is also ijat in, uh, in, the, in one of the, and the, uh, the pearl doesn't have shine, and you can't put dough together to make roti. So it's so important and it's very nice to see uh, uh, Divyansh is not here, you know, in terms of Divyang, uh, in terms of what is the meaning people derive from water. It's such an important thing and some of us who are old enough who lived in government colonies remember waking up at 5 o'clock and running and putting the taps on and saying, Pani agya, Pani agya, bhago, right? So I think uh, the fact that we have, and Pavan made a very good point about the baby is born, of course, there are problems of how we're going to educate this baby, what going to feed it, you know, which mama is going to, you know, take him to school, which chacha is going to, or, or chachi is going to, you know, look after. But it's important it's born. I think the idea is to be lauded, you know, in terms of that there's such a big area of India which didn't have drinking water, right? So, so I think uh, problems are huge, uh, and that's why this group is here. I think one of the things, uh, you know, I'm very new to the sector, uh, only seven years, but I think collectivism, and, you know, fact that there are multidisciplinary people, people who are working on ground, people who work on technology, people who work on policy, from private sector, from government. I think that's the only way you can solve complex problems. Because they're so multidimensional 
that if you take one approach, singular approach, which is quite easy to take in a private sector, I used to run a startup before this, it was 100 times easier than this. So I think it's great to have uh, uh, this group here. And some of the discussions were amazing. I'm, I just learned a lot. I don't, I don't think I knew enough about water, uh, you know, in, as, although I use it. And uh, just the richness of discussion and, uh, and the fact that the way the conference, was, the symposium was set up was people could be open. It's not a very big symposium. Very, you have to give the party line of what is true. There were some very honest discussions here. So I think the important thing is, uh, you know, what next? Sometimes, sometimes you come to these things and say, okay, we had a great discussion. There's some green shoots. So, so a couple of things. One is uh, the whole, this thing was born, uh, Pawan, me, and Professor met like about six months ago. Pawan is always trying to get people in and say, what can we do with IM Bangalore? And the whole idea was, can we, you know, create something which is action driven, right? Can we create ideas and initiatives by getting a larger convening of people uh, to kind of drive some actions? And I think one of the things about complex problems is, uh, is that, you have to move the equilibrium. You can't solve all the problems in one go, but if you steep, keep moving the equilibrium towards the right, suddenly things start happening, you know? So of course, sometimes the problems can become overwhelming that there's a political economy problem, there's a policy problem, all those kind of things, right? So, so I think uh, essentially the idea was to get some ideas, challenges, which can then be context adjusted. Of course, everybody comes from a different context. There are people from state, there are people from Gram Panchayat, there are people from central government. Everybody looks at the same problem in a different way. But I think my strong belief is there are commonalities in, in these problems if you think deeply enough. On, on surface, the challenges might seem different. So that's the idea, that's the core idea. Can we create some common themes which can be context adju adjusted to create some changes, right? So, so we'll not kind of let you go so easily. So the plan is to do another symposium in end of February uh, in Delhi, where we'll go to the Jaljivan mission, get more people in, and actually give the summary of what we learned, and what are the green shoots, what are the challenges, and some ideas about how they may be, you know, pushed to the right, right, from an equilibrium perspective. So between, uh, so this is end of February, right, Pavan? The, the symposium, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to read my, my glasses. Are. So what we'll do between now and February 2024 is, uh, by November 21st, there'll be a summary of uh, this session, both in terms of challenges and green shoots, what are the themes which came out which will be circulated to this team, and we'll refine it working with, uh, you know, various people. And, uh, and the idea is to, you know, create either uh, kind of subgroups or group of people who can work on specific themes and take it to a, st a stage where, see, articulation of problem is also very important, right? So I think sometimes we solve something and say, what was the problem statement, right? It's the famous Einstein quote that if I had one minute to save the world, I'll take 55 seconds to define the problem and then, then, then look at well, how to save it, right? So, uh, so I think that note will be uh, finalized by December, so never mind December, we'll work on that note together. And then February end is a plan to have the, uh, to, to, to have the workshop. Uh, I think all that remains now is to say thank yous. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you, Professor Gopal, uh, for you know, chairing this and for you know, uh, kind of uh, getting the idea together. So big round of applause for Professor Gopal. Uh, then Divya, who's kind of worked tirelessly as a program manager to get this off the ground. Please stand up, you know, if you haven't seen her. Big round of applause for her. And of course, Pawan, you know, I think uh, I've, I've known Pawan for, he's an amazing guy, you know. In terms of, he, he lives in Singapore, but you wouldn't believe kind of on the group and everything, how, you know, how he perseveres, you know. All the messages, is all the details from the, you know, what is the design of the placard? So I think I wouldn't embarrass you too much, friend. You're a, you're a good friend. But thank you so much. You are the true sutradhar of this, you know, team that has come together. Uh, so I think thank you so much, Pavan. And finally, you know, all the people who have come in here from the government, from the academia, from the, you know, uh, from, from other uh, organizations, thank you so much for coming down. I know it's a lot of work, but I hope it was useful. And I'm very, very sure that by February we'll have, sorry, <laughs> Aragyam. <laughs> So, so Pawar is also, he knows I am forgetful, so he keeps reminding me. So Arigyam, again, Manu is a great friend. You know, he was uh, in uh, EGov, he was one of the founders of EGov. And uh, we, we collaborated with Manu and Anuj and the team. Uh, so it's great to have the partnership. And uh, thank you, Pradeep, for coming down from Delhi. You know, I know uh, it's, it's very busy. So amazing day. And 
hope to see you all in February end. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we would like your valuable feedback. So please give us your feedback. Please scan this QR code and let us know how we can improve and what did you like and what you did not like. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you.